I'm Mark Denton, a private investigator. The dreary atmosphere of Humboldt County, California, always gave me eerie vibes. But it was undeniable. The desperate feeling to uncover the secret that led to misery of families who lost their loved ones. My amateur humor did little to help me cope this time. As I dug deeper into the case, locals warned me about strange happenings in the nearby forest. Late-night howls and disappearances had become all too common. I steeled myself, knowing I would have to venture into that forest sooner or later. I met with Sheriff Finley Wines, an old friend. We discussed the case over some lukewarm tea. Mark, you've got to be careful around here, he said earnestly. These woods are treacherous, and something dark and violent lurks within. I nodded cautiously, not yet willing to accept something beyond comprehension. But as more people came forward with chilling accounts of mutilations and unexplained vanishings, it became harder to ignore. Armed with a flashlight and a gun, I entered the woods determined to uncover the truth. The dense foliage muffled my footsteps as my nose registered the damp earthy scents. After miles of trudging through the foliage, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin coated in layers of dust and leaves. Inside, I found evidence of recent violence, tattered clothes and blood stains on furniture. Terrifyingly real claw marks smeared blood across walls like sinister artwork. My heart raced as I realized whatever just happened wasn't random violence but something calculated and cruel. As darkness fell, strange sounds echoed around me. Sporadic rustling leaves hinted at an unwelcome presence close by. Fear pressed against my spine as moonlight suddenly illuminated a grotesque figure lurking in the shadows behind me, human-like yet much taller, covered in coarse wolf-like fur, possessing claws sharp enough to tear through flesh with ease. Equal parts horrified and fascinated, I found myself paralyzed by the unnatural sight. The creature eyed me, its gaze burning into my very being. Malicious intent radiated off it, disturbing the air around me. My heart pounded wildly as I tried to fathom whether fight or flight would save me at this moment. Suddenly several missing people from the case flashed through my mind. This sadistic monster had been responsible for the incessant pain families in this town had suffered. Gripping my gun, I reckon I couldn't risk this vile predator getting away with more murders or worse. I mustered whatever courage I had left and confronted the monstrous beast. We snarled at each other, it bearing its gruesome fangs, while I aimed my firearm squarely at its fierce face, terrifyingly aware that one wrong move could mean certain death. As the standoff intensified, a mixture of rage and adrenaline surged through my veins while the creature snorted in disdain. Sweat trickled down my face, and I could see an anxious gleam reflected in its sinister eyes. It was then that I did something unthinkable. With trembling hands, ready to defend myself if needed, I cracked a joke. You know, you could have been a great werewolf statue for Halloween. The monster's confusion was palpable with a slight twitch of its head. Despite the dire situation, I chuckled fearfully knowing humor might be all that stood between life and unfathomable horror. As the bizarre standoff continued, I realized I needed help and quickly pulled out my cell phone to call my partner, Jake. He needed to know what was happening. Maybe he could provide some assistance in this desperate situation. While keeping my eyes locked on the creature, I dialed Jake's number and placed the phone next to my ear. The creature seemed cautious, remaining still but never breaking its gaze, clearly incensed by my actions. Jake, it's me, I whispered into the phone, trying not to provoke the monster in front of me. You need to get here now. There's something, something terrifying, like a giant humanoid wolf thing. It's the thing that's been behind all the recent murders in town. I don't know if it is even human. 
It has sharp fangs and an enraged expression that could paralyze anyone with fear. What? He responded, clearly disoriented. Where are you? Just stay put, and don't do anything rash. Within minutes, Jake arrived at the scene as panic continued to course through my body. His expression immediately morphed into one of sheer terror upon seeing the ferocious beast. Not knowing what else to do, we both aimed our guns at it. All right, said Jake as he steadied his breathing. Let's think rationally here. There have been many cases of mutilations and disfigurements from accidents or diseases that could make a person appear monstrous, right? I nodded hesitantly but couldn't shake off the creeping doubt. This creature felt nothing like a human. All we can do is keep this thing contained until backup arrives, Jake muttered as he reached for his radio. I'll call them now. As he informed our team about our location and our encounter with the monster-like figure in front of us, its agitation seemed to grow more intense with each passing second. Suddenly, with a gut-wrenching snarl and a burst of speed we couldn't have anticipated, the creature lunged at Jake. Blood splattered across the immediate vicinity as the beast mauled him mercilessly with its claws and teeth. Jake! I screamed, firing multiple rounds at the creature, but it hardly seemed phased. In mere seconds, Jake's lifeless body fell to the floor as the grotesque humanoid wolf turned its attention towards me. I stumbled back in horror, knowing that I had no choice but to run for my life. Every survival instinct kicked in as I sprinted through the darkness— desperately hoping for some sort of miracle to save me from impending regrettably gruesome fate. In my frenetic scramble to escape the relentless pursuit of this horrifying entity, I ended up cornered in a dead-end alley. The creature's furious snarls echoed off the bricks behind me as it slowly approached, saliva dripping from its enormous fangs. I feared that there was no way out of this nightmare— just when I had resigned myself to joining Jake in death's cold embrace, a cacophony of sirens pierced the night air. Our colleagues had arrived. Floodlights washed over the alley, catching the monster mid-advance, momentarily blinding both of us. Taking advantage of the confusion brought on by the sudden illumination, a swift tactical response team swarmed into action and surrounded the beast. As they unloaded trank darts into its hideous form, it eventually collapsed to the ground with a defeated growl. As relief washed over me like a tidal wave, my heart sunk at the realization that Jake was gone forever, killed while trying to protect not only me but our entire town. In the investigation's aftermath, forensic experts pieced together evidence suggesting that we had encountered an exceptionally rare genetic aberration that yielded a human-wolf hybrid-like appearance. Not a werewolf per se, but certainly not an ordinary human either. Regardless, the townspeople's safety had been restored, and the nightmarish series of murders had finally come to an end. With a heavy heart, I attended Jake's funeral, laying to rest not only a friend and partner but a true hero who faced unfathomable terror to save our community. From that day on, I was forever haunted by the memories of that beast and the loss of my partner. Yet through it all, I knew I too must remain vigilant in protecting our town, honoring Jake's memory and ensuring no other monsters threatened us again. September 4th, 1997. I'm a hunter. Name's Grady, Grady Olson. Been roaming the woods my whole life. Dad taught me how to track, how to gut a deer, how to quiet my steps so no critter would hear me coming. He used to say I moved like a ghost through the trees. I never thought those skills would come in handy the way they did. Up in the main backcountry, there's a patch of wilderness most folks steer clear of. 
old-timers called it the Devil's Tramping Ground, got its name from strange disappearances back in the logging days. They'd find men crushed, half-eaten, like something real big snatched them up and went to town. Reckon I've always had a streak of stubborn in me. Figured those were just tall tales, and I was more than capable. Had a cabin up that way, not much, just a place to stay warm during deer season. One morning, mid-season, I went out for a hunt, just myself and my rifle. Day was clear, sun shining through that crisp fall air. Felt good to be out there. I was following a creek bed, trying to pick up signs of a good-sized buck. Heard a snap of a twig behind me. I froze, then turned slow, but there was nothing there. Another snap, closer this time. That's when the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I knew with a gut certainty that I wasn't alone. I wasn't the hunter out here anymore. I was being hunted. I started moving faster, but trying to keep my footsteps quiet. Every sound in the woods seemed magnified. Every rustle of leaves, every squirrel chattering, all of it sent a chill down my spine. Something was following me matching my pace through the trees. My breath came in short gasps as I reached a clearing. Seemed like a good place to make a stand. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw nothing. I thought maybe I'd lost my mind out there, but then I looked down at the ground. There were footprints pressed deep into the soft earth. Too big to be a man's misshapen. The toes were all wrong, some freakishly long, and the claws, they were bigger than anything a bear could leave. My hunter's instincts took over. A predator that leaves tracks like that, it could be right behind the next patch of trees. I bolted from the clearing, crashing through the woods with no thought but putting distance between me and those goddamn tracks. I was nearing the cabin when I smelled it, that rotten meat stink, with a sour, chemical edge to it. It was everywhere, seeping through the trees, making my eyes water. My cabin was up ahead. Maybe if I could reach it, get inside, I'd have a chance. I picked up the pace, but a low inhuman rumble echoed in the forest, silencing the bird song. I burst from the tree lean, rifle clutched tight, and staggered to a halt. My blood ran cold. There was a shape by the cabin, huge and hunched, ripping at something with claws like knives. Even from a distance, I could see the leathery skin pulled taut over bone, the head low to the ground, too long in the muzzle. It turned its head towards me, and for a heart-stopping second, those yellow eyes focused on mine. My mind stuttered. That wasn't an animal. It couldn't be. Yet some primal part of me knew it was very real, and very hungry. The thing uncoiled with impossible speed, and the something it had been tearing at finally became clear. The mangled body belonged to Buck Riley, an old trapper who kept to himself. Must have heard the legends, same as me, and didn't believe them, either. I didn't wait around to see what it might do to me next. I sprinted for the tree line, fear spurring me on. Behind me came a screech that tore through the air, followed by the pounding of its feet on the ground. I didn't dare look back. Just kept running, branches whipping at my face, lungs burning, until I couldn't run anymore. I collapsed behind a fallen tree, gasping for breath. Night was falling, but I knew I couldn't go back. That creature, it would be waiting. There was no way I could face it and win. I stumbled through the darkness, guided by the stars, half delirious from fear and exhaustion. Didn't stop until I hit the old highway, and by some miracle, flagged down a passing car. Never went back to those woods. Sold the cabin for a pittance. Told the folks who bought it that it was too far from civilization didn't feel right being way out there. They laughed, said I was getting soft in my old age. 
didn't tell them that sometimes being soft means living long. There was a news report a few weeks later. Couple from New York, hikers, gone missing in that same patch of woods. They never found the bodies. Some nights, I think I can still hear that monstrous scream, and I smell that rot in the air. Makes me wonder how many others are buried up there in the devil's tramping ground, forgotten and mourned by no one. I got lucky. Got a second chance. But some things, once you've seen them, they brand themselves in your brain. They change you. They make you a ghost in your own life, forever haunted by the shadows in the trees. I always thought my love for quiet places, the solitude of dense forests and towering trees, made me perfect for the life of a park ranger. That belief held strong until this morning's patrol in Yellowstone National Park, which started as routine as any other. I'm Lau Gormley. Been doing this for almost fifteen years. Now you'd think nothing could surprise me out here. The dawn mist hung low between the pines as I made my way along the north trail near Crystal Creek, checking for signs of overnight campers or wildlife activity. It had rained the night before and the earth was still soft underfoot, leaving clear impressions on the path. That's when I saw boot prints, large ones, paired with an unsettling drag mark that didn't match any animal I knew. I radioed back to base but got only static. Sometimes these valleys played havoc with signals. The decision to follow seemed instinctual. Maybe someone was hurt and needed help but as I traced the drag marks deeper into a rarely visited thicket, I stumbled upon a scene that turned my professionalism into cold dread. There lay an array of backpacks, tents torn apart as if gutted by sheer force. The embers of a campfire were still warm, clicking softly amidst an overwhelming silence. No laughter or chatter usually accompanying a campsite greeted me, just waiting silence. I called again for anyone present to make themselves known. Again no response came except for the creaking of aged cedar boughs above me. Something about it felt methodical, planned, an intelligence behind those broken tent poles and half-buried utensils. It wasn't until I began investigating further that I found traces of blood smeared across leaves leading away from the devastated campsite. In many years on this job, you learn there's much about nature that is brutal and unforgiving, but this was different, methodical almost. Precisely then, something rustled at the edge of my vision, tall, unnaturally so with limbs too thin to be human lurching between shadows where sunlight struggled to reach. It moved with an accusatory slowness toward me, a deliberate intruder in our realm of existence. I've read stories told by hikers and hunters alike about creatures in these woods, dismissed them mostly as stories conjured by overactive imaginations or too many nights under open skies. This shape, though, it defied explanation. Having enough presence of mind to keep my service revolver within arm's reach never felt more comforting. As I ogled at its daunting figure— no face discernible yet every sense screamed it watched. It abruptly stopped as if realizing for the first time its own visibility. Static crackled through my radio then, a voice barely audible beneath friable layers calling for assistance near Gibbon Falls reporting sounds, cries unheard before. Gripping my weapon tighter than ever before but keeping it holstered, I backed away slowly from what now seemed a dance with death itself the dark form receding like mist into the forest's heart once I put distance between us. Its origin remained ambiguous, but undoubtedly linked with what happened at that campsite, possibly responsible for who knows how many missing persons reports filed over the years without a trace found. But right then another crackle from my radio broke through more distinctly, 
an emergency alert warning all rangers to gather immediately due to multiple sightings reported across the park. Panicked visitors claiming encounters with a creature fitting eerily similar descriptions. My radio screamed for my attention, but the creature's presence commanded it more. I reached for the radio, eyes locked on the spot where the figure had vanished. I called in, voice steady. Ranger Base, this is Unit 12. I'm on my way. I made my way to the gathering point, the tension from Rangers palpable. We stood in a loose circle, more than a dozen of us. Our supervisor spoke with urgency about safety and crowd control. Sightings across the park had tourists spooked. In teams we spread out, instructions clear, evacuate visitors and watch for the creature. My partner and I moved from campsite to campsite, urging calm, guiding hikers and families to their cars. We stumbled on a devastated camp near evening. Tents torn, gear scattered. Blood-painted grass and tree trunks in grim patterns. Clear marks of claws gouged in wood spoke of violence. No animals carried grudge or tool to exact such revenge. I called it in while my partner checked the area. Base, carnage at Camp 4, I reported. No survivors found. Silence answered save for crackling static as words struggled to form responses. Night closed in as we continued our patrol. A shriek tore through the forest, human, direction uncertain. We ran toward it, flashlights piercing darkness ahead. We found nothing again but signs of struggle, earth upturned, branches broken at unnatural angles suggesting immense strength. A glimpse then, large limbs moved, more heard than seen among trees ahead coated with dirt and fluid as though risen from earth itself, a hunter without need for stealth or disguise. It charged, not random escape, but straight toward us with intent clear. My partner fired rounds. The creature faltered. It fled with a bone-rattling growl. The forest quieted around us once more. Blood pounded through my veins harder than ever before. Others arrived minutes after, no need for words. Sight was enough to convey horror shared between us all. We scoured nearby areas again, found tourists trapped by fear but alive, guided them out under escort overwhelmed by silent relief. Dawn brought departure of visitors by the hundreds, a mass exodus leaving camps empty and silence heavy with absence. Reports filed mentioned an unknown predator. Details scarce except shredded evidence of its passing and memories too vivid to recount without shudders. Days turned as routine became reinforced watches and patrols replaced leisurely treks. No contact since that night neither hide nor hair found of our assailant yet whispers spread of a creature mythic in stature that ruled these woods undisputed but not seen till now, or perhaps never truly gone just waiting for its moment to reclaim lands we assumed owned by man alone. This tale ended not with a capture, nor a sighting confirmed by more than terrified witnesses but an echo of what once was, a reminder that sometimes nature holds cards not meant for human eyes nor understanding, a beast carved from darkness and primeval will the foundation for new legends cradled in uneasy sleep of those who walk these woods wary of what moves within shadows where sunlight struggles to reach. Everyone always figures nothing exciting happens in small towns. I used to think the same, especially here in Sawmill. Oregon, where the most thrilling thing was the occasional wayward deer wandering onto the highway. The name's Clay Hudson, and I drive a truck for a living. My route's mostly back roads, where the trees crowd so close it feels like moving through green tunnels with just a patch of sky above. It was on one of these ordinary runs when things went south. I was behind the wheel of my rig, 
listening to some tunes and enjoying the solitude of the road. That's when I spotted something out up ahead, a car skewed sideways off the shoulder, driver's door ajar. No flames or smoke signaled an accident. It just sat there looking abandoned. Odd place for a car to up and quit. I slowed down my rig and hesitated because you never know what you're walking into out here. But something nagged at me. It could be someone in trouble. The nearer I got, the clearer I saw. The front windshield splattered with red. My gut tightened, and I stopped my rig a fair distance away, called into dispatch but got no signal. Typical for this stretch of woodland road. So much for calling for help. It was up to me. I remember pounding on Cletus Fillmore's front door after clambering out of my truck. Cletus ran a kind of all-purpose shop at the edge of town and lived close enough within earshot of honking horns if assistance was needed out here on this lonely stretch. He opened the door, his face scrunched in confusion before he noticed the urgency in my eyes. Together we approached the car with caution creeping into our bones. Look at that, Cletus whispered as we both stared at what we could only assume to be blood marring the glass. The inside told an even grimmer story, one nobody would want to stumble across during their nine-to-five grind. The dashboard smeared crimson, upholstery torn up like an animal had clawed through it. Worse yet, there wasn't a soul around. Expecting someone? Cletus asked as we surveyed our surroundings, but my response got lost as noise beyond the tree line caught our attention, a soft crack like a branch snapping underfoot. We lingered by that car until sundown when our dread shifted into survival mode. Something about darkness inching closer makes you consider things you wouldn't dare imagine under broad daylight. That soft sound from earlier started up again but harsher this time, like someone not both errant to cover their tracks any longer. I never believed much in bad omens or creepy feelings, but standing there next to Cletus with darkness cascading around us and those noises inching closer, I could swear trouble was hunting us down. We turned on our heels and sprinted back towards my rig never looking back though every snap and rustle made it clear something pursued us. A man, maybe? I'd never seen him before or knew he existed, but every sense told me he wasn't someone you'd want to cross paths with alone on these deserted roads. The fear that gripped me. Funny, right? A burly trucker who thought he'd seen everything, felt raw and unfamiliar as we reached my rig and fumbled inside. Cletus slammed his door shut just as I caught sight through my side mirror, a glimpse of someone, or something, lurking at the edge of those woods staring back with an intensity that froze my blood. Engine started, wheels spun, and my rig took off with a roar. I kept my eyes on the road ahead but couldn't shake off the image in my side mirror of that man by the woods. Cletus sat silent gripping the door handle like it was the only thing keeping him from flying apart. High beams pierced the night as we put miles between us and that unsettling standstill. Dared not stop, not even at lights. Each red seemed like an open invitation for whatever pursued us to catch up. We covered ground until we found ourselves at a truck stop, lights like beacons promising some semblance of safety. I dialed 911 with hands shaky from exertion rather than fear because fear had been spent on the sprint back to safety. Emergency, what's your trouble? There's someone in the backwoods off Route 40, by Miller's Farm. Look dangerous. I gave my name, location, a brief account of our afternoon turned nightmare. The dispatcher promised to send someone to check it out and told us to remain where we were until officers could speak with us. Blue and red lights eventually flooded the parking lot as two police cars pulled up. We detailed our ordeal again, described that unshakable stare from the edge of trees. Officers noted everything down with a professionalism that suggested they believed us without question. 
One stayed to take more of our statement, while the other left to investigate our claims. Cletus and I exchanged a look. Relief was mutual but unspoken. Hours passed before we received update. Not far from where our car had stalled they found signs of a scuffle in woodland dirt. Some personal items too, battered wallet, torn jacket, either belonged to Cletus nor me. Police didn't share much else besides cautionary advice before they let us go. Made it clear this was an open investigation now and our part was over unless they needed more from us later on. That trailer felt more like home that night than any house could, doors locked tight, curtains drawn closed so tight not even slivers of dawn could pierce them when morning arrived. First light brought news over radio waves. A known fugitive had been captured in woods near Route 40. Mugshot on local news matched the face etched into my memory from last night's glare inside mirror. The realization hit me along with announcer spelling out his name. It was Russ Tanner, wanted for violent crimes stretching two counties wide. Cletus hit road solo after that, said he needed time and his own space to process everything. Could hardly blame him for feeling that way. Guess sane went for me too cause sleeping soundly wasn't much an option anymore. Not when every noise reminded me of snapping twigs and growing shadows of evening woodlands. In days that followed, what happened settled into something else entirely. The kind of story you recount but half expect folks won't fully believe cause it skirts edge of normal so sharply you can barely keep it within bounds yourself. But live through something like that and those bounds stretch whether you want them or not. It's fact pure and clear as sunrise after darkest night you vowed would never end. Told myself things would get easier with Tanner behind bars. Truth is even with fear faded and threat gone, peace didn't come easy if it ever really came back at all. You always think you're prepared for the unexpected, especially in my line of work with the U.S. government. Yet nothing could have braced me for that damp, bewildering morning in the dense forests of Olympic National Park, Washington. My team and I were stationed at a black site, conducting classified genetic research far from prying eyes. My name is Waldo Humphrey. Dr. Waldo Humphrey, and I'm not the type of guy who balks at shadows or gets jittery over the rustle of leaves. But that day was different. The air felt charged, like static before a storm. My colleague Jethro Klein had been uncharacteristically silent as we made our way to the lab, our boots squelching in the mud, a sound somehow both ordinary and ominous. We were working deep in the woods because some things just can't be done within sight lines of society, not without causing a panic, anyway. Stretching along the horizon as far as eyes could scope, evergreen giants whispered secrets that would unsettle any sharp mind. Opening up our facility that morning, we discovered something that chilled us to our bones, three cages forcefully bent open from the inside out. Whatever we had been experimenting on was no longer confined to its cell. I hefted my standard-issue sidearm, a motion that felt comically inadequate given the circumstances. We need to find it before it finds anyone else, Jethro stated grimly. We split into twos to cover more ground. Jethro went west with Delia Ash while Rowan McKnight accompanied me eastward. As expected in situations teetering on catastrophic disaster's edge, communication crackled into lifelessness on our radios. Rowan suggested we double back towards a creek we passed half an hour ago where tracks dotted the soft earth. Big prints, bigger than any native wildlife had rights to leave behind. That's when we heard it, a sound like nails on chalkboard but magnified across forest expanse a screech that caused birds to take panicked flight above us. Swearing under his breath, 
Rowan pointed in a direction northeast of us. All humor had leaked out of our situation like air from a punctured tire. We approached cautiously, squinting through dense fog rolling between trees like slow waves. That's when we received an emergency call from Delia via satellite phone. It was short and fractured by static. Jethro, down, need. Cutting across terrain with mounting dread quickening my heartbeat steadily with each thunderous pulse in my ears wasn't how I envisioned this Thursday proceeding. And yet here we were. Through a copse of alders I saw movement, a fleeting shadow flitting between trees. Too large and oddly shaped to be human or bear, this figure seemed to have sprung out of dark folklore tales whispered by superstitious locals. Its silhouette only visible through mist shrouds, a grotesque elongation of limbs with an unnerving lurch to its gait. Rowan and I halted at a small clearing. Our breaths created foggy doppelgangers in cool air while something not far from us ripped through underbrush with thrashing fervor. Delia emerged from ambushing tree-line hysteria plastering her features as she scrambled towards us. It's got Jethro! She gasped, pointing back the way she came breathlessly. Something. Not human. Assurance was supposed to be my specialty, but hollow reassurances refused forming on tongue as gnarled branches snapped nearby announcing that this abhorrent game's final stage was thunderously close at hand. We pressed on. Rowan fumbled for his phone, hands shaking. No service. I checked mine. Same result. The creature's presence had cut us off from the outside world. Guys, listen, Delia said, gripping her knees. We need to get out of here. We followed her gaze toward the dense forest where she had emerged. Sounds of branch breaking, closer this time interrupted any further discussion. We ran. The path before us wound through trees and over roots, a natural maze that seemed endless. I heard it behind us, the heavy footsteps that seemed to shake the earth with each hit. Rowan stumbled. I helped him up quickly and we sprinted forward until we reached a ranger station. It was empty, abandoned in haste, equipment scattered. We need to stay inside, Rowan said, pushing a heavy cabinet against the door. Delia nodded. Her face was pale. Night fell but sleep never came. The creature prowled around the shelter. We could hear it sniffing at the walls, its grunts and growls a grotesque serenade. Dawn broke with no sign of the beast. We took our chance and bolted from the station toward the nearest town several miles away. Upon arrival, panting and wild-eyed, we told our tale. Jethro's disappearance prompted a search party, but they found nothing. No tracks, no blood, only his torn jacket near the clearing. The town lived in fear after that day. People whispered warnings to travelers, avoid the forests at sundown. Months passed with no further attacks leading some to brush off our encounter as an animal gone rogue, a bear, perhaps, or something undiscovered by science living deep in the woods. I sit at my desk now, glancing at leafless alders swaying outside my window and sometimes I can't help but wonder about those dim-lit forests, and about Jethro, who had faced whatever it was that hunted us that one dreadful Thursday. This happened to me a few years back, during one of my regular solo ventures. See, I'm into long-distance backpacking. The more isolated, the better. It's about that push, finding some inner strength as much as it is about scenic routes. My name's Thaddeus, but everyone calls me Thad. This trip's goal, the Appalachian Trail, deep into the lush forests of northern Georgia, had some decent weather reports, good enough to last five days or so. Now you should know my style. Less about pre-planning, more about just winging it, 
finding a trailhead and hitting the ground running. That spontaneity led me to this off-the-beaten-path trail deep in the heart of the Chattahoochee Forest. Not much info available online, but damn if it didn't look perfect. That first day was pretty damn exhilarating. Steep ascents, dense undergrowth. It had everything I craved. But by evening, with a decent campsite located, fatigue hit hard. You don't realize how those little moments of adrenaline stack up. One minute you're setting up the tent, the next your flashlight's beam catches this thing. Movement maybe 200 feet away, right on the edge of the tree line. My heart kicks up a notch, big cat? That'd explain the stealth. What happens next, I still struggle to believe. It steps forward just slightly giving me a partial profile against the dusk light. Tall. Lanky. Definitely not a bear or anything normal. Then it just vanishes into the brush. My brain plays tricks. Shadows of branches must have done it. The sense of unease remains, but after a good night's sleep, it feels like a strange half-remembered dream. Day two starts off strong, and that initial weirdness fades. My usual pace is faster here. Maybe that initial unease had some residual influence on my subconscious. This trail, it wins a lot. Turns back on itself. My sense of direction, usually excellent, starts feeling off. But who cares when this kind of natural beauty surrounds you? I even joke out loud that if I keep walking in circles, that's just more time with these ancient trees. By third day in, that joke doesn't feel so funny anymore. It's subtle at first. Feeling eyes on me, an odd sense of deja vu with certain trail markers. But that nagging voice tells me it's my overactive imagination. When you do solo hikes, the mind finds weird little ways to entertain itself. Or maybe those woods get to you like that after a while. Then the clearing happened. Now, there was absolutely no indication that I'd come across this spot before. This was new territory. My route was meticulously outlined for just this scenario. No way should I've arrived back here a wide, flat space ringed by towering pines. Yet, it felt so unsettlingly familiar. And at the far end, nestled right where the trail led back into the woods, was a structure. Not your run-of-the-mill hiker's shelter, something older, a simple cabin. My curiosity overpowers any lingering caution. It turns out to be unlocked. The inside has this untouched quality, yet not abandoned. There are supplies, but dusty. Old newspapers with yellowed pages litter a side table. What pulls my focus, though, is this map tacked to the peeling wall. It's ancient, detailing these very woods. But some hand-drawn markings, scribbled arrows and notes. I feel the hairs on my neck stand on end. They trace a route that matches, almost exactly, my own haphazard wanderings through this dense forest. Now, alarm bells are blaring full force. This place. There's intention in that map. The cabin wasn't just discovered. It was sought out. My exit is quick. Almost a scramble back into the sunlight. That familiar path unfurls into the pines. A mocking sign of normalcy compared to what lurked inside. That evening... It wasn't just the setting sun giving me an uneasy feeling. This was when I found it. That same damn lanky silhouette, stalking me just ahead. Moving parallel to the trail, mirroring my every step. At least now there was clear sight of the thing. Long legs, almost unnaturally so, with this hunched gait. Then, for a chilling moment, it turns its head slightly in my direction. That face, if you can call it that. Like a smooth, featureless egg laid atop its shoulders. No eyes, no mouth, nothing recognizable. Every cell in my body screamed to run, 
but some morbid fascination held me rooted. Then it was gone again, dissolving back into the dense undergrowth. By dawn, I'd packed camp at a speed bordering on Manic. There was nowhere to go but ahead, back down the trail that had led me into this mess. But by midday, it felt like every turn brought nothing new. My footsteps echoed against the same giants I'd been passing for days. I finally broke, yelling, probably more to convince myself I wasn't just insane. At least there was an answer, sort of. An odd sound coming from up ahead. Like nails against wood, only a slow, deliberate scratch. That damn cabin loomed up again. There, on the dusty porch, was some fresh movement. That hunched form, only, something in its arms. My brain scrambled. Was it holding another person? No, the size was wrong, almost childlike. There was something shiny, catching the sunlight as it swayed slightly in that creature's grip. My blood ran cold. A deer antler, and hanging just beneath, a torn scrap of blue nylon that matched the exact shade of my jacket. No question, it had caught my scent. The creature had tracked me for miles. My mind races back to that dusty map in the cabin. Was I simply its newest addition? A specimen to be tracked, hunted. Who knows what twisted fate awaited me within those walls? That's my turning point. No way I was facing whatever waited inside that cabin. Instead, there was the dense forest, and with primal determination, I dove in. Every sense was on overload, every snapping twig a predator behind me. My legs burn, lungs aching, but fear propels me faster than I've ever moved. After what feels like a lifetime, a shimmer of pale road breaks through the green gloom. Never has civilization looked so damn sweet. Stumbling to the edge of that asphalt, hitching a ride with a wide-eyed truck driver, my only words were, Please, just keep driving. Now some folks have theories about backwoods cults, or government experiments gone wrong. Me? I don't know what that thing was, what sick obsession drew it to that damn cabin in the woods. I just know my return route from there was deliberately vague. No one would believe me if I tried to explain the unmarked trails. There's a reason there was no trace of that place ever existing. Those old Appalachian woods might hide beauty, but they also hold dark secrets best left undisturbed. I still hike, but these days I choose well-charted routes, those paths less likely to turn on you when you least expect it. A couple years back, I took a solo trek through Olympic National Park in Washington State. One of those bucket list things before settling down to raise a family. You hear stories, sure, but I've always figured myself more grounded than your average superstitious yokel. I'm Reginald, by the way. Now, the first couple of days went off without a hitch. Rain drizzled. Birds chirped. I nearly twisted my ankle a few times. Standard wilderness fare. On the third night, after setting up camp and cooking far too much rice, I tucked in and fell asleep fast. There was a crunch from deep in the woods behind my tent that awoke me. Heart beat faster. Not your usual squirrel scurrying or a branch snapping. Deeper, heavier. Maybe a curious deer? Bears weren't uncommon for the park. It happened again, maybe twenty yards closer. I sat up, eyes straining against the pitch black. And then it hit me, the smell. It wasn't exactly rotten, but like old fur, wet and heavy. Something primal in my brain yelled that this wasn't good. My pocket knife felt pitifully inadequate. There was another step and something massive shifted just beyond the weak beams of my flashlight. 
Then silence. I waited, ears straining. Nothing. The smell seemed to linger. Eventually, after an eternity, I drifted into a light doze, adrenaline slowly dissipating. I woke up at first light, everything seeming deceptively normal. I was sure I hadn't imagined it. Something had definitely been out there. I took a cautious sweep of the immediate area, half expecting to find deer tracks or some evidence of a bear raid. Nothing. Not even a broken twig. Shaking it off, I decided to pack up and move on. Didn't feel right to linger there. Funny how these things work on you. An hour in, hiking toward the next intended campsite, it struck me those footsteps wouldn't leave marks. Whatever stalked me in the night left zero trace. My mind wandered. Bigfoot? Come on, that was kid stuff. I chuckled nervously. It's funny how fear makes you believe anything. Mid-afternoon, with my mind finally back on the beauty of the trail, I came across something that stopped me cold. In the clearing ahead, an old, battered backpack lay half-buried in the mud. A tatter of bright neon fabric snagged on a nearby vine. A woman's pack, smaller than mine. Alarm flooded through me. My heart sank. This felt so, so wrong. This pristine piece of backcountry, it shouldn't have these grim little mementos. There was more, scuff marks around it, signs of a struggle. Something big had dragged it. My brain raced. Bear attack? Why leave this behind? And why had I found it, when rangers usually swept these trails? Had anyone been reported missing? I was too far from signal to find out. Fear kicked in again, pushing adrenaline. My body didn't want to get any closer. Every instinct screamed to bolt. But if someone needed help, I pushed forward, breath catching in my throat. No blood, thank God. Maybe there was an ID inside. My hand shook as I fumbled with the zipper. Nothing but soggy granola bars and a damp wad of tissues. It wasn't enough, not enough to tell the story. I looked out across the empty clearing, my mind spinning into dark speculation. Then came a noise from deeper in the trees. Not a crunch this time, but heavier, like the sound of bipedal movement. My blood ran cold. The smell hit me again, that wet, musty odor. Something huge was close. I looked up in time to see it break through the tree line. It was massive. Easily over eight feet tall, a dark and hulking silhouette towering over the trees. Thick, matted fur rippled in the wind. My eyes strained to make out details, but it moved too quickly, staying partially obscured by the brush. Humanoid, for sure. It moved on two legs in an uneven, rolling gait. The hands reached nearly to its knees, and as it turned I caught a glimpse of its face. Sunken eyes, a massive brow, and a jaw that protruded from a muzzle-like snout. My brain short-circuited. My thoughts tumbled Bigfoot? Impossible. The thing roared, a deep, guttural sound that rattled my bones. I was frozen with a sickening wave of terror. It took a menacing step towards me. That's when I snapped out of it. Logic and common sense went out the window. There was no weapon I had that could take this thing down. The backpack was forgotten. Nothing in this world mattered beyond surviving the next few minutes. I bolted. I don't know how long I ran or how far. Trees whipped past me in a blur. Roots, rocks, fallen logs, nothing could deter me. The forest closed in like a dark, claustrophobic tunnel. It seemed like miles stretched to eternity. The heavy steps pounded behind me the stench filling my nostrils. Every ragged breath clawed at my throat. Stumbling, I burst onto a logging road. 
luck pure and simple. Desperation urged me on. A flicker of movement up ahead, a truck parked next to an old access gate. I didn't slow down, shouting and waving my arms like a madman. The driver seemed just as spooked as me, slamming the vehicle into gear as I flung myself into the passenger seat. We peeled away down that dirt road, leaving a cloud of dust. We never spoke a word. I glanced behind and saw nothing but empty trees. I collapsed back into the seat and lost it. Trembling, tears streaming, the primal fear poured out. It took years to process that experience. No one believed me, of course. Local news never had a missing person matching the backpack's owner. It all felt like a fever dream. It didn't stop the nights where I woke up sweating, the forest pressing in, the stench filling my nostrils. My skepticism died up there, I can tell you that. Some things, they just shouldn't exist. The wild places hold far more secrets than we believe. Sometimes we find them before they find us. To this day, I wonder what was out there. An unknown animal? Some freak evolution? I never dared return to Olympic. All I know for certain is, it was a Bigfoot. It has to be. A few years back, I headed west for a solo road trip, looking to break free from the monotony of city life, the stress of work. I'd always loved the open road, the feeling of endless possibility it brought with it. Figured I'd clear my head, maybe find something I didn't know I needed. I never found answers out there, not any I could put into words anyway. I found something, all right, but I'll get to that. I picked Wyoming mostly by chance, just put my finger on the map and decided that's where I'd go. Wyoming, turns out, is a whole lot of empty. Wide open spaces, scrubland as far as the eye can see, with the mountains a distant promise on the horizon. First few days were exactly what I wanted long stretches of highway with nothing but my thoughts for company. Found a few backwater motels in the kind of towns you blink and miss. Mostly, though, I camped. Slept under the stars on a bedroll. By the time I hit Yellowstone, figured I'd gotten my fill of solitude. Park was a zoo, tourists clogging the roads at every turn. Still, it was beautiful. Old faithful, bubbling sulfur pits, the whole nine yards. Hiked a few trails got back in my car, and headed down towards Grand Teton. Thought I'd find a less crowded campground there, maybe get a little peace. That night's where everything changed. I found this spot off the main road, pulled off into the trees. Seemed like nobody'd been there for a while. I got my fire going, had a bite to eat. Figured I'd knock out early, get a fresh start at the park in the morning. I don't know what woke me. It was pitch black out, only the faintest glow from the dying embers. I lay on my back, listened to the insects chirp, the night breathing around me. That's when I heard it, footsteps just outside the ring of firelight. Probably a deer, I figured. Maybe even a bear. Heart went into overdrive, but I knew better than to sit up. Animals don't like surprises, and a flashlight beam would spook anything that wandered close. I lay there, holding my breath. The footsteps moved in fits and starts, circling the perimeter of my camp. I couldn't make out the shape of whatever it was. Just an oppressive darkness moving against the even deeper darkness of the trees. Then it spoke. Not with any real language I can place just a guttural rumbling that echoed my pounding pulse. The hair on my arms went stiff. I could smell it now, too. A wet, animal must that hung heavy in the still air. Panic was building in me, 
a rising tide, but another part of my brain, the logical part, reminded me of the pistol I kept in the glove box. I edged forward slowly, muscles tensing to leap for the car. Then it charged. Thing was monstrous, whatever it was. Moved on two legs yet hunched low. Massive limbs, thick with coarse hair, tore through the underbrush. I scrambled for the door handle, fumbled for the keys, and felt my stomach sink in despair. They weren't in the ignition. I was trapped. I don't remember much after that. Just the terror of this thing crashing through the trees, the guttural snarl as it loomed outside. Glass shattered, the passenger door ripped clean off its hinges. I must have reached for the pistol by instinct, pumped off a few rounds in the general direction of the howling. It retreated, the sounds fading into the night, but not by much. It stalked me the rest of the night. I cowered in the back seat, every creak and rustle sending my heart hammering. I could see its reflection in the rear view, a pair of glowing eyes fixed on me till sunrise. When it finally retreated, I stumbled out of the car at first light. It looked like a bomb had gone off. Seats shredded, glass everywhere, and my pistol gone. Figured the creature must have knocked it into the darkness when it attacked. Then I saw the blood. Not mine. Fear gave way to adrenaline, a desperate need to get as far away from there as possible. Whatever that thing was out there, it was hurt. I left the car where it lay and started walking, no direction in mind, just forward. Made it out towards the main road eventually, flagged down a trucker, told him I'd been attacked. Cops came, took a report. They found the carcass of an elk half-eaten on the edge of my campsite. Figured that's what I must have drawn in, a predator following its meal. Maybe it got aggressive, maybe I fired a warning shot and scared it off. Maybe. Here's the part that stuck with me, the part that still crawls under my skin at night. When I described the thing, the cop just nodded. Said they got reports like this every so often. Folks out in the wilds, alone, they come back with crazy stories. I started to piece it together, remembering whispers and rumors of old legends, stories passed down from the native tribes. Something they called a skinwalker. The cop just shrugged, a noncommittal grunt. Didn't confirm, didn't deny, just that knowing look. Like he'd seen too many shattered people after their brush with the unknown. So, here I am, back in my apartment, back in the grind. Most days I pretend that none of it happened. I get by, I guess. Then there are the nightmares, the jolt of awakening to perfect darkness, convinced there's a pair of burning eyes watching from the corner. Nights when I hear the tap at the window and swear it's not just a tree branch. I know what I saw, and more terrifying, what I felt. It was a hunger, an alien intelligence that saw me not as prey, but something else. I don't know what it wanted. I couldn't know. There are corners of this world untouched by men, by roads, by light. And in those corners, other things hold sway. Things older, darker, things for which we have no words. I brushed shoulders with one out there in Wyoming and paid the price. A part of me will always linger in the darkness under those towering peaks, trapped in that monstrous gaze. A living reminder that the vastness of the wild isn't just beautiful. It's also hungry. It happened a couple of years back during a camping trip in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Now I'm no outdoors a type, truth be told. But my old man, bless his soul, always said fresh air does a boy good, gets the city stink out of your pores. Figured the old place I used to camp with him might be the only thing to pull my head out of a tailspin after Sarah up and left. Anyway, 
That's not the story. I'm Jasper, by the way. First night was fine. Found a secluded little valley, built a fire, the usual routine. It's funny how when nothing good's been happening for a while, you get real wary of when things look up. Like the universe might have another sucker punch ready to go. Well, turns out I wasn't wrong. That night, I got woken by a noise. I'm not a deep sleeper, and with this being bear country, my hearing was tuned to any snap of a twig. This wasn't a twig snap, though. It was an odd rasping sound, like leather dragging over the dry pine needles. I lay there, ears straining into the blackness. Whatever it was, it sounded close. Something brushed the side of my tent, flimsy nylon barrier between me and whatever. My hand found the old hunting knife Dad gave me on my thirteenth birthday. Held it with white knuckles. Nothing more happened. But I didn't get another wink of sleep, just lay there on edge till the first sliver of dawn light started seeping through the trees. I peeked outside. No tracks in the dirt, nothing disturbed besides my own stuff. Maybe I just freaked myself out. Figured some animal poked around while I slept raccoons maybe. Still, there was an itch between my shoulder blades I couldn't shake some primal instinct humming on high alert. I decided a second night in the wilderness wasn't what my nerves could handle. Packed up quick, got back on the main trail to head for the car. Here's what gets me when I think about it. There was another body right near there that morning. Didn't know till later, of course. Found by a couple of trail rangers when I pulled into the lot and stumbled, babbling, towards them. I heard them on their radios a bit later calling it in. Female, they said, mid-twenties, looks like an animal attack. The way they said it, the hesitation in their voices, that's how I found out there was more to it than just a regular mountain lion. My skin went as cold as the stream rushing near the trailhead. I kept thinking back to the sound in the night, the brush on the tent wall. My rational mind tried to explain it away. Coincidence. I hadn't even heard anything that sounded like an attack. But my guts, the primal core of me knew otherwise. There'd been something out there, right outside, watching me. And that poor woman, maybe a bear, had to tell myself that. Maybe a freak incident, the bear came into her camp at night, took her by surprise. I knew damn well it wasn't anything so mundane, just like those rangers knew in their hearts. Thing is, you got no way of really proving a thing like that, do you? Can't tell it on the news, the stories no one would believe. Doesn't mean they aren't true. Doesn't mean it ain't still out there. That's when I learned about them. You might think it was the cops, but it wasn't. They asked enough questions, determined I wasn't a suspect, or crazy enough to need locking up, then sent me on my way. I looked it up myself, after I got back to my empty apartment. Old legends of the Lakota, stories of beings that could shift form, walk between worlds, the skinwalkers. The more I read, the more chills went down my spine. Those old descriptions— Things seen out of the corner of the eye, a towering shape just at the edge of the tree line. That inhuman rasping. They talked about how these things hunt stock, how they single out prey. Maybe that's why that poor woman died, and not me. Maybe I wasn't its quarry. Maybe it knew I'd just pass along, leave those wild places undisturbed. Or maybe that's what saved me. The fear I'd felt, radiating off me like a beacon, kept me alive. Fear marking me as something too tainted by civilization for its tastes. It's how I make sense of things. How I sleep at night, if you can call it sleeping. Always feeling that phantom chill at the back of my neck. A reminder of the unknowable things that slip through the gaps in the world. 
I don't head out that way anymore. Sarah was wrong to walk out on me, wrong to say city living had turned me soft. No, those wilderness nights? They taught me how soft we all are. Just a flimsy tent wall, a layer of skin between civilization and the vast, hungry dark where things far older than any city still stalk the night. They watch us, I think, even in the neon-lit heart of towns. Maybe it's always been that way. Waiting out there, just beyond the reach of the headlights, until we stray too far. Thing is, now I know those old stories are real, there's no going back. I may have escaped the Black Hills, but I brought what lurks there back with me. Sometimes I'll glance down a dark alley, catch a glint in the shadows, or see a shape, almost human, moving quickly away. Those nights, all I can do is shut my eyes tight, wish they're only tricks of the light, and cling to the hope that someday those old legends will be wrong. That those hunger-ridden eyes might lose track of my scent, might move on, and for a fleeting moment, just maybe, leave me in peace. A year back, maybe a bit more, it was the kind of trip that makes a guy like me, plain old Maxwell Baker, feel alive. Sure, I work in an office, staring at screens and shuffling spreadsheets. I'm not an outdoors fella by any means, but a long weekend deep in the Florida Everglades with an old buddy? That's different, that's adventure. We hit the loop road rented a beat-up canoe from some weathered soul at the outpost, and headed down the sludgy brown canal. Thick mangroves pressed in, gnarly roots clutching at the banks like they meant to drag us down. Birds made a ruckus above, bright flashes of color against the tangled canopy. Day one was smooth paddling. We made camp on the raised ground of a tree island, fired up some freeze-dried grub that would make a gourmet scoff, and settled in for stories swapped beneath the sky thick with stars. Dan, my friend, he's an old hand at this stuff. Talks a good survival tale, but my mind always drifted when he got to weaving the scary ones. Next morning, Dan was up at sunrise, eager for his daily fishing ritual. I rolled out of my sleeping bag, joints a bit grumpy, and stretched. That's when I saw it. A few yards off, beneath the dappled sun on the muddy bank, a human hand. Palm up, fingers splayed like some kind of obscene starfish. And I mean, just a hand. Like a kid might have pulled a fake one out of a Halloween goodie bag. Dan! I hissed. Get a load of this! He came... Fishing rod abandoned, and we both gaped. It wasn't a dummy prop. Too realistic, the skin too, mottled. The air felt thick, my breakfast threatening a return trip. Dan, always the more level-headed of us, knelt beside the severed hand and turned it over delicately. His brow creased. Looks like a clean cut, and not too long ago, he offered his voice low. A clean cut? The Everglades just got a whole lot creepier. We did the only thing that seemed to make sense, fished around in the muck for more body parts, reported it to the outpost folks, and got ourselves the hell out of there. I thought it'd be some big missing person story splashed across the news, the start of a chilling mystery I could tell over drinks with a shiver. But nothing like it never even happened. The months that followed were weird. I couldn't stop thinking about that hand. Had someone lost it to a gator? But where was the rest of them? Swamp folk? Too outlandish, even for Dan's campfire fables. At night, I'd dream of that lonely palm reaching for me, the fingers twitching. Then, a few weeks back, I saw the news bodies turning up in the Everglades. Not whole ones, just pieces. Authorities were baffled, 
the internet ablaze with morbid speculation. Swamp monster, cult slayings, cover-ups. It was all out there. Me, I kept quiet. I knew what I'd seen that day, knew it deep in my bones. But nobody would believe the truth, and neither did I, really. Yesterday, I went for a drive. Needed to get out of the stuffy city, breathe air that didn't smell like stale coffee and printer toner. Hours slipped by, and before long, there I was, pulled up on the shoulder of Loop Road. I just sat and stared down that dark, muddy canal leading into the heart of the Everglades. Something stirred a ripple in the murky water. Maybe a gator, maybe a fish, or maybe the thing, the thing that took that hand. I got back in my car, hands shaking as I fumbled with the keys. I didn't see its full form. Hell, I don't even know what it really looked like, just a flash of movement from the corner of my eye. But I know this, there's something out there in the swamps, something hungry, something that collects its victims in pieces. I'm not going back, not ever, and tonight I'm barricading my door. Dan, the fearless survivalist, he hasn't answered his calls for weeks. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe this is all just in my head, but that hand, that hand I saw, it was as real as the mug on my desk. People talk about folklore, about the old swamp boogeymen whispered around campfires. The stories, though, they can't prepare you for the truth. They can't make you ready for what lurks just out of sight, what's waiting for you with an appetite for blood. They don't tell you that sometimes, the most terrifying monsters of all, those the kind with names like skunk apes straight out of campfire tales, are the ones that are very, very real. A few short years ago, I spent some time down in the Everglades. I've always been a bit of a nature buff, a city boy that yearned for the wild. I grew up on stories and documentaries, and there was something about the vast, untamed wilderness of the Everglades that had always fascinated me. Finally got a chance to make the trip happen, right after finishing college. Wasn't quite what I expected, but that's a story for another time. I should make it clear, I never intended to go deep into the swamps. Figured I'd stick to the tourist trails, boardwalks, airboat tours. I wanted a taste of the Everglades, not the whole meal. My plans didn't quite work out that way. I'd gone on a boat tour with a gaggle of other tourists, nothing too special. The captain was an old Cajun by the name of Thibodeau, missing a few fingers and a slew of teeth. He was the real deal, knew the swamp like his backyard. I struck up a conversation with Thibodeau, told him a bit about myself, my love of the wild. I don't know what got into him, maybe my enthusiasm, maybe a few too many beers for breakfast, but he started in on the backwaters, the hidden places the tourists never saw. Talked about creatures lurking out there, things that folks had only gotten glimpses of. Then he started whispering about the Rougarou. Now, I'm a skeptic at heart. Don't believe in ghosts or Bigfoot, and this Cajun folktale about a swamp werewolf? Come on. But Thibodeau swore it was real, and he had those beady eyes that made you hesitate before dismissing him outright. He offered to show me, said he knew a spot where one had been sighted. Said some park rangers had found a half-eaten, well, something, out in that hidden corner of the swamp. I was hooked. It was stupid, reckless even. Yet, there was something about the thought of seeing a piece of that hidden world that drew me in. Maybe I needed to shake off the predictability of life, the routines I knew I'd fall into if I wasn't careful. So like an idiot I said yes. Figured it was worth the risk. Thibodeau steered us down a narrow channel, the airboat barely squeezing between the overgrown banks. 
the swamp took on a new character here. Darker, the trees reaching out like gnarled claws. It was quiet, too, except for the hum of the engine and the buzzing of insects I couldn't even begin to identify. Tension was building in my gut, a mix of fear and excitement I refused to acknowledge, even to myself. We reached a spot where the channel widened out, trees clearing to form a sort of basin filled with stagnant water. The smell hit me first, a rotten, sickly sweet odor that I'd never encountered before. I gagged, but Thibodeau just grinned, flashing those broken teeth. He cut the engine, and the airboat drifted to a stop in the murky water. It was there I first saw the bones. Scattered about the banks, half submerged in the mud. They were too big to belong to deer or other swamp critters I knew about. Some were not on, others shattered. Thibodeau pointed towards a cluster of trees with a single, scarred finger. Said the rangers found the remains over there. It was curiosity that propelled me forward, the morbid kind you get watching true crime documentaries. I waded through the water, boots sinking into the muck. The bones were scattered like some macabre puzzle, and I'm ashamed to say, a thrill went through me trying to piece them together. It was more than just bones, though. Shreds of clothing were snagged in low branches, the fabric stained with dark splatters. That's when I heard it, the sound. At first, I couldn't place it. Low, guttural. It didn't sound human but it didn't sound like any animal cry I'd ever heard either. I froze, the thrill replaced by a bone-deep terror that pulsed through my veins. I turned to Thibodeau, only to see him staring not at me, but at something behind me, in the trees. His face had gone pale beneath his leathery skin, and his eyes were wide with a primal fear that mirrored my own. That's when I turned back slowly and saw it. Standing in the shadows of the trees, it was massive, towering over me even though it was hunched. Thick fur covered its body, matted and rank, a sickly gray-brown color. Its legs were long and powerful, its claws like scimitars. But it was the head, it looked like that of a wolf, monstrous and twisted. Its eyes glowed a hellish red that pinned me in place, a deer frozen by headlights. Everything in my brain screamed to run, but my body wouldn't obey. The creature let out another of those unearthly growls. I saw its yellow teeth, stained red, its maw filled with more teeth than any predator should ever have. Then it charged. My body finally responded. I turned, scrambling back towards the airboat on blind instinct, fueled by pure adrenaline. I could hear the creature behind me, its breath hot and fetid on my neck. It roared in frustration, so close I could feel its spittle on my skin. Then a splash, and the sloshing of something massive tearing through the water. I didn't dare look back. I clambered into the airboat, fumbling with the keys. The engine coughed, then roared to life. Thibodeau was at the controls, his face a mask of terror. We shot back down the channel, the world blurring at the edges, nothing but a kaleidoscope of green and brown and the smell of muck and fear. We didn't stop until we were back at the main dock. I stumbled out of the boat, legs barely holding me. Thibodeau refused to speak, his eyes distant, lost in his own nightmare. I tried to find the words, to thank him, to apologize, but nothing made sense anymore. I never went back into the depths of the swamp, took a few more tame tourist trips, and then headed back north. Told myself it was just an animal, a bear maybe, or a panther I'd seen in a distorted way. But at night, when the shadows dance just right, I see those red eyes and hear that guttural snarl again. I remember the feeling of the creature's hot breath on the back of my neck. The Everglades holds a lot of secrets. Some folks try their whole lives to uncover them. 
I learned my lesson. Sometimes the best thing to do is leave the unknown undisturbed. The locals, they talk about the rigorous still, always in hushed whispers. They say it's a curse, a beast born from the blood and darkness of the swamp itself. Maybe they're right. All I know is that out there, in the hidden places where sunlight struggles to reach, things lurk that defy explanation. Things that remind you just how small you are in the face of the wild. This happened to me on July 23, 2010. I can still picture how the sun hit the water of the lake that morning, how the air smelled of pine and warm earth. Ten years in search and rescue, Olympic National Forest, and hey, some folks might call that veteran status. Don't let me fool you, though. Those woods can still surprise you. My name's Eli Parker. It started out simple, missing campers. A couple from out of state reported they hadn't made their scheduled pickup at the trailhead. We'd seen a lot of that sort over the years. Hikers who overestimated their skills or got themselves turned around on an unmarked path. It usually turned out to be nothing more than an extra day out in the wilderness or a sprained ankle. I rolled out to the trailhead, my partner, Maya, on the radio coordinating from base camp. We took in the scene, car still there, backpacks missing, looked like they meant to overnight. I took one trail cut, Maya took another. The forest lay quiet, the usual rustle of breezes and bird calls. Part of the job is learning to read the woods, you know? To tune in to the subtle signs. That tightness in your chest when something feels off. I found the campsite maybe two miles in. And that's when my gut gave that tight twist. It wasn't some abandoned site. It was wrecked. Torn up tent, scattered supplies, footprints leading away in a hurry. I radioed Maya to come in fast, my hand on my gun. It takes a lot to spook deer. Whatever did this wasn't natural. We tracked them through dense trees, ground broken with heavy footfalls and dragged branches. Then we came across the first body. It was the woman. My stomach lurched. I'd seen death before, part of the job, but something about the way she lay, twisted and broken, the blood. I forced myself to focus. Had to. There was still the man, alive maybe. Maya found a sign, the remains of his shirt torn and bloody on a branch. We moved through the trees like ghosts, every crack of a twig sounding like gunfire. Then, we reached a clearing and saw it. I've dreamed of that moment a dozen times since. It stood in the dappled sunlight, an immense hulk of muscle and mangy fur. A bear, at first glance, but then it turned. The proportions were wrong, its torso long, its arms huge and dragging like an ape, and its head flat-faced, jutting jaw bristling with fangs that could rip a man in half. Its eyes met mine, small pinpricks of black with a cold intelligence that made me shudder. That wasn't an animal. It was something else. It let out a blood-chilling roar and charged. We fired together, the shots cracking through the quiet forest. It staggered blood spattering the ground, but it didn't stop. I sprinted one way, Maya the other, trying to break its focus. I could hear it crashing through the trees, gaining on me. Every nerve burned, my pulse a wild drumbeat in my ears. I stumbled, smashing my knee hard on a rock. Pain exploded up my leg. I thrashed to my feet and limped on branches tearing at my clothes. Behind me, the crashing grew closer. I knew I wasn't going to outrun it. I risked a glance back. It was almost on top of me, those massive claws raking the air. I tripped, rolled, and blindly fired. The shot hit its shoulder. 
It roared again, twisting away, blood flying. I scrambled behind a thick tree trunk, heart pounding. For a long, terrible minute, I heard nothing but my ragged breaths. I pictured it circling me, those black eyes studying the tree trunk. Then, slowly, the sounds of its retreat came, snapping branches, fading footsteps. I sagged against the tree, my legs like jelly. My radio crackled, Maya calling in frantically. It took me a while to find my voice. I told her I was alive, told her to get back up, every unit we could spare, and told her to warn them, that thing out there wasn't a bear. When they finally choppered me out, battered and exhausted, I saw the search party heading into the woods. Bunch of brave souls, walking into what I just escaped. There were more tracks, they said. The man's body was never found. In all the official reports, it's listed as a possible bear attack, victims missing. Nobody believes me about what I saw. Makes sense, I guess. Who'd believe in a monster? Easier to explain it away, pretend it fits in some box we can understand. But at night, sometimes, I hear that roar again. I see those black eyes. And I know, deep down, the worst part isn't what I saw that day in the woods. It's knowing the damn thing is still out there. The rangers like to call it Big Shadow, a local legend to scare rookie hikers. Me? I think it's earned a name far worse than that. This happened to me on September 16, 1997. Back then, I was pretty new to search and rescue, working in Sequoia National Park. You get to thinking you know a place after a while, the rhythm of the seasons, the trails like the back of your hand. Funny how arrogance can bite you, right? My name's Doug Carter. That morning was crisp, the kind of fall day that makes you want to chuck it all and live out in the woods forever. We got a call about a missing hiker. Older guy, experienced, but out alone and overdue by a day. Seemed routine, lost his bearings, maybe a twisted ankle. I set off up the south trail with just a radio and some basic gear, figuring I'd be back down by nightfall. The first few miles were quiet, just the sound of my boots on the trail and birds chattering. That's the thing about those forests, they can shift on you. One moment, it's all sunbeams and friendly rustling, then the trees close in, and you feel watched. I pushed that feeling down, told myself it was nerves. Then I came across the deer carcass. Half hidden behind a log, for in ragged clumps, the ground soaked with blood. It looked fresh, but not like any predator I knew would leave it like that. Half eaten, torn open in a way that made my stomach churn. Then a prickling crept up the back of my neck. That feeling of being watched, only stronger. That's when the woods went truly silent. I turned in a slow circle, hand near my gun. Nothing moved. The usual bird song was gone, even the wind seemed to stop. My radio crackled, but it was just static, so I switched it off to save the battery. I kept going, heart pounding in my chest. I had a job to do, and besides, broad daylight, right? But every shadow, every rustle, had me jumping. That gnawing sense of wrongness clung to me, and finally, it became too much. All right, come on out. I barked into the silent trees. Funny joke, guys. Real funny. My voice echoed back, empty. Nobody laughed. My grip tightened on my gear. This wasn't some prank. I pushed on, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of the hiker. I found tracks, heavy but not quite human. They were too wide, the toes splayed oddly, 
sunk deep into the soft ground. I followed them, uneasy feeling growing by the minute. This wasn't some lost old man. They led me deep into a gully, choked with ferns and fallen trees. The light barely filtered through, making the ground dim and tangled. I heard a rustling up ahead. Relief flooded through me, finally, the hiker. Sir? I called out, moving cautiously toward the sound. Then it emerged from the shadows. At first, my mind couldn't make sense of the shape. It was huge, easily seven feet tall, hunched over on powerful legs. Its skin was leathery, covered in coarse, patchy fur. Its arms were long, tipped with thick claws, and its head. It had the muzzle of a wolf, but larger, the jaw bristling with teeth made for ripping flesh, not gnawing on bones. The eyes that fixed on me were black as tar, with a hungry intelligence that sent ice down my spine. It took only a split second to register that this wasn't any creature I'd ever seen before. Then it lunged. I fired, emptying my gun in the dim light. Two shots hit their mark. The creature roared, a bone-shaking sound that sent tremors through the ground. I turned and ran. It crashed after me, much faster than anything that size had a right to be. Branches whipped my face and tore at my pack. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but desperation fueled me. I dodged fallen trees, leaped rotting logs, the thing gaining on me with terrifying speed. Ahead through the trees, I saw a break in the foliage, the glimmer of a stream. I put on one last burst, scrambling down the steep embankment and hitting the river bank hard. I half crawled, half swam across the icy water, the creature's roars echoing behind me. I made it to the far bank and plunged into the thick bushes on the other side. There was a narrow game trail there, and I sprinted along it, barely daring to look back. Eventually, I stumbled out onto a logging road flagged down a truck, and radioed for help. They found my shredded pack back at the gully, my gun a few feet away, the chamber empty. The hiker's body was never recovered. And the thing, they didn't find a single trace of it, no fur or scat, no clear footprints in the damp earth. Nobody believed me after. Called it shock, animal attack, whatever they could to fit it into a neat explanation. Easier than admitting something unknown lives out there, something that defies reason. The higher-ups hushed it up. But what they don't know is that I saw it again, years later. There was another missing hiker case, same general area. Just a glimpse, a hulking shape in the shadows by the lakeside. It saw me and that chilling look in those black eyes flashed with recognition. Folks like to tell tales about these woods. Bigfoot, spirits, whatever. I know what I saw, and I know it wasn't any legend. Maybe they even have a name for it, the locals who've glimpsed it over the years and survived. Something about the way it moves, the way it hunts. I call it the Strider and I pray every day I never cross its path again. Now you tell me I'm crazy? That's all right. I slept with a loaded rifle beside my bed for years after. I knew deep down it was still out there. And if I, Doug Carter, veteran S.A.R., said some monster lived in Sequoia Park, well, folks might get wise. Start to wonder why so many people go missing in those woods never to be found. Sometimes, ignorance is bliss, ain't it? It all started with an innocent joke. I remember telling my partner, I bet we'll find Bigfoot before we find the missing hikers. My name is Silas Worthington. I'm a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service. 
Little did I know that this simple comment would lead to one of the most terrifying experiences of my life in the vast Alaskan wilderness. On a typical search and rescue mission, I would be working side by side with my dear friend and fellow officer, Nathaniel Clarkson. We had just arrived near the base of the Wrangell Mountains to search for two lost hikers who had failed to return from a trek through these untamed lands. The wilderness here is as beautiful as it is deadly never underestimate the power of Mother Nature. As we trekked deeper and deeper into the forest, Nathaniel began sharing a story he heard from an old-timer at the local bar about some strange happenings in this area. The details were vague, but there were mentions of a creature that stalked these parts, leaving terror in its wake. We laughed it off but slowly realized something was amiss as we came across mangled tree branches and strange tracks too odd to be from any animal around here. The air carried a strange, faint stench that neither of us could quite place. After several hours, we stumbled across a small clearing and found what appeared to be a campsite with gear scattered all around, a chilling sight. Nathaniel began inspecting the area as I focused on finding any traces of our missing hikers. That's when we heard the first growl from deep within the forest. It sent shivers down both our spines. The rustling sound drew closer, and suddenly our joking about Bigfoot no longer seemed to be funny at all. We barely caught a glimpse of this elusive being, swiftly moving through the trees with ease. Its large form barely saw the light of day. Its fur was matted, like that of an old bear, and adorned with a wild, twisted mane. Its eyes emitted preternatural hostility. We locked eyes for just a moment before this monstrous animal quickly vanished back into the shadows. Feeling uneasy about what we witnessed, Nathaniel attempted to dial for backup on his radio. We were met only with static in response whatever this creature was. It seemed to have destroyed our only connection to the outside world. Concern turned into raw fear as the sun began sinking behind the mountains, casting sinister shadows all around us. There was very little we could do but continue our search, arming ourselves with rifles and fingers firmly on the triggers. The terror reached new heights when we finally found one of the missing hikers, or rather what remained of him, ripped limbs and a trail of crimson staining the ground. Nathaniel and I shared silent glances, knowing there would be no rescue this time. We decided it was time to leave this cursed place as soon as possible, to warn others before meeting a similar fate. As we cautiously made our way out of the forest, I tried lightening the mood with a joke. You know what they say, laughter's good for morale. The laugh that erupted from Nathaniel's throat was more akin to hysteria than mirth. The decision to leave quickly became crucial as the creature started to follow us. It moved through the trees with impressive agility, staying hidden but maintaining a close distance. Our guns seemed to hold no power over this beast. I knew our only hope was to flee and avoid a confrontation altogether. We continued our trek through the dense forest, desperately trying to get away from the creature hot on our trail. Its growls served as an unwanted reminder of its presence, preventing us from splitting up and seeking help separately. As we navigated the rugged terrain, we discussed our options for finding assistance. Well, there's no way in hell we're getting a signal out here. Nathaniel muttered as he glanced down at his radio once more. I heard there's a small town nearby. I replied hesitantly. If we can make it there, maybe someone can help us. With little choice, we headed towards the town, each step taken in sync with the whispers of the wind coming closer from behind. Every snap twig or rustled leaf forced my heart to jump in my chest. As we neared the town, Relief washed over me, believing that we might finally find safety among other people. But when we arrived at the outskirts of the seemingly abandoned place, a horrifying scene awaited us, homes torn apart with claw marks decorating the walls, and ominously silent streets devoid of any life. Nathaniel looked at me with panic 
in his eyes. We need to keep moving. Another growl erupted nearby, sending us into full sprint towards a seemingly intact house. The door creaked as we slammed it shut behind us, barricading ourselves inside. It wasn't much protection, but it was something. Okay, I whispered between heavy breaths. First thing tomorrow morning, one of us has to go for help. We can't split up, Nathaniel countered nervously. Not after what we've seen. I sighed, acknowledging the truth in his words. You're right. Let's just hope this creature doesn't find us before we can leave in the morning. The sun rose without incident, and we cautiously stepped out of our temporary sanctuary. But as we did so, we discovered a chilling sight. The remaining limbs of our fellow hiker displayed grotesquely outside the house. Fearlessly fueled by rage and desperation, we began our journey towards civilization. We encountered no further signs of the unyielding predator but remained aware that it was never far, its presence forever following and tormenting us. The day seemed to stretch on with every step taken towards safety. Finally, as the grueling ordeal neared its end, we reached a populated area where our pleas for assistance were met with empathetic faces. We watched as concerned citizens organized search parties for our fallen companion and rallied together against the monstrous threat lurking in the woods. Overwhelmed with relief knowing that an entire community now stood with us against that beast, Nathaniel and I begrudgingly accepted that some things are beyond comprehension or explanation. But I will never forget what happened in that forest, nor forgive myself for not being able to do more to save my fellow hiker. The memory remains engraved in my mind as I honor their sacrifice and strive to warn others about the lethal force hidden deep within the wilderness. Though I continue to carry on with my life outside of that nightmare, the haunting growls from within the shadows will forever hold me captive in fear and unsettling reminder of what lurks just beyond our understanding. I stumbled upon a rusted sign that read, Welcome to Hanneridge, a small town hidden deep within the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. My name is Lyle Quinby and I was driving through to visit some distant relatives I had never met before. Each turn of the winding, narrow roads made my stomach churn with uncomfortable anticipation. Little did I know the town held a terrible secret that would soon force me into a fight for my very life. As I pulled into town, I noticed that the streets were eerily quiet and the few people I did see seemed tense and fearful. My cousin, Bonner Webley, met me at a local diner. Over a cup of weak coffee, we exchanged pleasantries before he whispered urgently, You need to leave this place as quickly as you can. Trying to lighten the mood with humor, I joked about his lack of enthusiasm in welcoming his long-lost cousin. But his gaze remained locked on mine, deadly serious. My friend Irvin saw something horrible near those woods. He continued, hesitatingly. It's not safe here anymore. He only gave me scant details. Irvin witnessed an animalistic creature standing upright at least eight feet tall with a lanky frame and elongated limbs, head reminiscent of a deer or stag skull adorned with sharp antlers, all muscle and bone and terror. With curiosity drawing us like moths to a flame, foolishly undeterred by potential danger, Bonner, Irvin, and I decided to investigate this unknown beast lurking within the dense forests near the mountain's edge. As we trekked deeper into the seemingly endless woods under moonlight that fractured through lush leaves above us, we couldn't shake an uncanny sensation that we were being watched by unseen eyes. The barely perceptible snapping of twigs echoed through my mind like gunshots in an empty canyon. Then suddenly, there it was, briefly glimpsed in the shadows before it vanished into the darkness. Moments later, an indescribable stench filled the air, a disgusting odor that made our eyes water and stomachs churn. 
Bonner whispered to us. It's close. Though we lacked weapons or experience, we knew help would be too far away to reach us in time and had no choice but to rely on each other in this remote wilderness. Alert and on edge, we startled at every rustle and snap within the dense forest terrain. Irvin nervously cracked a joke about our situation, a weak attempt to break the tension. What do you call an antlered beast that loves pecan pie? A stag nut. He chuckled at his joke as much as we winced in our collective efforts not to make any sound. That failed attempt at distraction did little to dispel the mounting dread as the sense of being pursued grew stronger. We disagreed on whether we should call for help or continue our way deeper into the forest. I argued that it was foolish to assume someone would hear us amidst these vast woods, and Bonner supported me reluctantly. Then we came upon a disturbing scene, a makeshift shrine at the base of a massive tree. Dried blood, animal bones, and remnants of personal belongings were scattered amongst crude symbols etched into the ancient bark. A collection of photographs of people who once lived in Hanridge adorned this unspeakable monument like a grotesque gallery wall. The revelation of their fate fueled our determination despite racing hearts and thundering breaths rising through clenched teeth. We pressed on with flashlights shaking violently in our grip as we scanned our surroundings, constantly searching for some fleeting glimpse of that creature now fully aware of our presence. Suddenly, mere feet from where I stood, it emerged from behind a crooked tree with limbs extended like a predator's claws, its antlered skull shrouded in blackness beneath twisted branches overhead. We froze in abject horror. The imposing figure loomed over us, scanning each of us as if assessing our worth. W. We need to do something now! Bonner hissed urgently. Everyone split up! Move! Panicking and acting on instinct, our trio scattered in different directions, knowing that by separating, at least one of us might make it back to safety. As Bonner's desperate command echoed through the forest, I ran blindly in one direction, hoping to put as much distance between the creature and myself as possible. I didn't know if anyone else had survived or if they even managed to get far. The sound of snapping twigs and crunching leaves filled my ears as I moved faster, not daring to slow down or look behind me. My chest heaved, sweat dripped down my face and my legs screamed, but survival instincts overpowered the physical agony. At some point, I stumbled upon a small clearing and hid behind a bush. I took out my phone, cursing under my breath as I discovered no signal my worst fear realized. Just as I was about to give up hope, I saw the faint glow of a flashlight approaching from the opposite side of the clearing. But it wasn't one of us. It was a park ranger. Overwhelmed with relief, I hurried towards him and told him quickly about our situation. He immediately contacted his colleagues on their radio system and led me back towards the looming danger. As we made our way through the dense foliage, we came across Bonner and Reed, injured but alive. Reed had a gash on his arm where the creature had swiped at him with its cruel claws, while Bonner's face was bruised from his fall after being thrown against a tree by a blow from one of its mighty limbs. The park rangers arrived swiftly with additional reinforcements and weapons. They informed us that they had been tracking several unexplained disappearances in Hanridge and surrounding areas but never encountered anything as terrifying as this creature before. We cautiously continued through the woods in search of it, split into smaller groups for safety. We moved in silence, our hearts pounding with each step that brought us closer to the unknown predator. A guttural growl filled the air reverberating through our very bones before we even saw any movement. Then, with lightning speed, the creature lunged at one of the park rangers, its antlers aimed to impale his chest. With a cry of pain, he fired a shot, hitting it in its torso, causing it to momentarily falter and retreat. More shots rang out as the rangers unleashed a hail of bullets upon the beast, 
forcing it further back into the darkness. It let out an enraged howl that seemed to shake the entire forest as blood trickled from its numerous wounds. The chase continued, hours blurred together under the weighty tension as we followed the sound of crackling branches and guttural growls mixed with gunfire. Eventually, the trail of blood and destruction led us to a cave, hidden amongst twisted roots and buried deep within a hillside. In an instant, the vile creature sprang from its hiding place and attacked another ranger, knocking him off his feet with a powerful swipe. He went down, lifeless under the weight of his injuries. As moments stretched like knives' edges in our throats, we fired our weapons without thought or strategy. The deafening cacophony of gunshots and desperate screams filled the air as we emptied our magazines in a desperate last attempt to survive. At last, bruised, battered and exhausted, it was over. The creature lay motionless on the cave floor, and was shattered, limbs twisted at unnatural angles and head finally severed from its amalgamated form. We took stock of our casualties, three park rangers dead and several more injured. The rest would carry scars for life both physical and mental. Together with the remaining rangers, we carried our fallen comrades out of the forest alongside fragments of that haunting creature, ensuring it would never terrorize again. The ordeal changed us all forever, bound by an unspeakable horror that had lurked in Hanrid's shadow. Reverence for those who fell in the pursuit of our escape would forever be etched in the annals of history. And as we began our long and silent journey back, the haunting images of the creature and its grotesque shrine remained, a warning of the unknown dangers that can lie just beyond perception. For those who were left, we would bear witness to a truth that went far beyond logic and reason. And from that day on, we understood that life could make no promises of safety, each moment haunted by the remnants of what once entangled our existence with something so terrifyingly real. I remember that day with stunning clarity. It was a typical day on the road, just me and my trusty 18-wheeler, cruising through the remote parts of the U.S. I've been a truck driver for 15 years now, and my name is Tate Goodwin. On this particular excursion, I found myself passing through northern Idaho, surrounded by miles upon miles of dense forests. As I continued down an isolated mountain road, I saw something that immediately caught my attention, a mangled deer carcass sprawled out across the pavement. The poor thing looked like it had been through a meat grinder. Yikes! I muttered to myself. Nature can be brutal. Little did I know that fate had something worse in store for me. A few more miles into my journey, I stopped at a small roadside diner to grab something to eat. Inside were just two other people, the waitress named Doris and another fellow truck driver named Cecil Whitley. As soon as he heard me order my usual burger, Cecil turned to me and asked me if I'd seen anything unusual out there on the road. What do you mean by unusual? I asked curiously. Cecil's eyes darted around nervously, but he decided to elaborate nonetheless. He began telling me about an infamous man who had been terrorizing anyone who ventured too far into these isolated parts of Idaho. The locals referred to him only as the Mountain Man. Apparently, this guy lurked in the vast wilderness targeting truck drivers in particular. What he did to those unfortunate souls was beyond horrifying, something unforgettable and excessively brutal, like skinning them alive or burning them after he tied them up. Right after Cecil finished his ominous tale, we heard screeching outside followed by a thud, the unmistakable sound of an accident. We better check it out, I suggested while jumping out of my seat. Cecil and I ran outside and saw a bloody motorcycle splattered on the road. Looking around, I spotted a pair of hiking boots sticking out from behind my truck. Fearing the worst, we approached slowly and with caution. 
As we neared, we were horrified to see the lifeless form of a man, twisted in ways that shouldn't be possible. Although I tried to suppress my panic, I couldn't shake the feeling that Cecil's story might have something to do with this gruesome scene. We decided to call for help, but unfortunately, our phones had no signal. It seemed like we were on our own. That evening, we hunkered down in the diner with Doris, waiting for any sign of rescue, and perhaps hopelessly trying to avoid any encounter with the mysterious mountain man. The hours crept by as tensions rose. During one lengthy stretch of silence, Cecil suddenly burst into laughter. Why did the chicken cross the playground? he asked rhetorically. Doris and I exchanged glances before he triumphantly delivered his punchline. To get to the other slide! We stifled uncomfortable chuckles as Cecil insisted that laughter was the key to getting us through this night. But as darkness closed in around us, our shared humor took a back seat when each new sound sent shivers down our spines. Around midnight, Doris went to check the back door for any signs of trouble and was gone longer than expected. Concerned for her safety, Cecil and I decided to investigate. Following her path through the diner's dimly lit kitchen, we found a small pool of blood at the back door which had been left slightly ajar, a sinister invitation for something or someone unwelcome. The eerie sight suddenly jolted us into immediate action. We grabbed weapons available in the kitchen, me, a frying pan, Cecil, a fillet knife, and began searching for Doris who we assumed might be in danger. We moved quietly, investigating every corner, opening every door, and keeping our ears tuned for any suspicious noises. As we inched our way towards the final room, a secluded storage space, the sounds of struggle were unmistakable. We burst through the door, prepared to encounter the villain at any cost, only to find that an enormous shelf had toppled onto Doris. She was trapped but alive, tears streaming down her face. I saw him. She panted laboriously while pointing towards a small window. He was out there, watching me. Cecil and I exchanged a worried look before rushing to the small window that Doris indicated. Outside, we caught a glimpse of a tall man with long, greasy hair and a cruel smile staring back at us. The stranger's eyes held malice and an unsettling intensity. My heart raced as I weighed our options. Cecil, thinking quickly, whipped out his phone to call the police. However, we were horrified to find that we had no signal in the storage room. Helplessness washed over us as we realized calling for assistance was not an option. We need to get out of here, Cecil whispered fiercely. He could come back any minute. I nodded in agreement, knowing that staying put would only endanger us further. With Cecil supporting Doris's weight, we made our way through the diner, looking for an escape route. We reached the front door only to find it had been barricaded from the outside. Panic began setting in as we realized our situation was growing grimmer by the second. Try the fire exit, I suggested urgently. We moved cautiously towards the exit at the back of the diner, hoping that it hadn't been tampered with as well. To our immense relief, it was unobstructed. Without wasting another second, we slipped through and found ourselves in a dark alley. As we navigated through the shadows, the sound of footsteps echoed behind us. Gasping in terror, we pressed ourselves against the wall as the man from before walked by us with an eerie confidence. Cecil held on to Doris tightly, his hand pressed firmly against her mouth to smother her soft cries of pain and fear. The stranger passed by without noticing us submerged in darkness. Our hearts still pounded wildly, but we were thankful for our temporary deliverance. We spent several minutes calculating our next move when Cecil had an idea. Let's split up, he proposed in a hushed tone. I'll take Doris to the hospital, and you can go to the nearest police station for help. 
Despite my reluctance to separate from my friends, I knew Cecil was right. It was our best chance of staying safe. As Cecil disappeared into the darkness with Doris, I stealthily made my way towards the police station. Every noise had me on high alert, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I, too, was being watched. Finally, I reached the police station and burst through the doors. Exhausted and terrified, I told the officers everything that had happened. They listened with grave expressions before springing into action. A group of officers escorted me back to the diner to join Cecil and Doris as we waited for news. When they didn't return after an hour, an unsettling dread filled us with despair. Just then, a police officer approached us solemnly. Cecil demanded to know what had happened, desperation evident in his voice. The officer hesitated before delivering the terrible news. During their search for the stranger, they had found our precious diner set aflame. We couldn't believe it. Our cherished workplace had been destroyed in just one night. The stranger was still at large. With a heavy heart, we watched as the ashes of our past smoldered beneath a rising sun. Our lives would never be the same again. The haunting memory of that stranger's sinister gaze would forever remain etched into our minds as a grim reminder of what we had lost that night. But as we stood there among the ashes, one thing remained crystal clear. We would endure this devastation and rebuild our lives together, stronger than before. I woke up with a pounding headache, and the first thing I noticed was the smell and overwhelming mixture of damp earth and rotting leaves. My name is Conrad Steinberg, and I'd come to this remote forest in the heart of Louisiana to cover an environmental story for my newspaper. Little did I know that I would stumble upon something far more sinister. As my headache subsided, I noticed a small hut tucked away between the towering trees. Thinking it might be my salvation, I approached cautiously. A rusted set of wind chimes clattered together with each breeze, somehow amplifying the feeling of isolation. A sudden cry for help echoed through the woods, snapping me back to reality. It sounded like Marion Westmoreland, the park ranger who had accompanied me on this trip. We were here to document the impact of industrial pollution on the local wildlife. She was passionate about her work in saving these natural resources. Grabbing my camera and trusting my instincts, I followed the sound of Marion's distress calls. As I ventured deeper into the woods, things got stranger with every step. Peculiar animal-like tracks marked the muddy ground beneath me. I finally stumbled upon Marion at a clearing, tied up and gagged beside a makeshift fire pit. She looked unharmed but terrified, gesturing wildly at something behind me. My heart dropped as I turned around to discover an enormous creature unlike anything I could have imagined. Standing on all fours, it towered over even the tallest man and appeared to be part animal and part human. Its fur-covered body was muscular, with long, powerful limbs ending in clawed appendages ready to snatch up anything they touched. Large fangs protruded from its seemingly snarling mouth as drool dripped onto the ground below. The creature moved toward us with unintentional grace, revealing its full size and strength. A growl rumbled from within its chest, sending chills down my spine. From the shadows, several other similar creatures loomed, all demonic and equally as terrifying. When I was younger, my mom used to say, Conrad, you've got more courage than common sense. Turns out she wasn't wrong. Summoning all the courage I could muster, I shouted at the creatures to get their attention. Miraculously, they turned away from Marion and focused squarely on me. It bought her just enough time. Having taken some self-defense classes in college, I searched my surroundings for anything useful. 
As luck would have it, a fallen branch lay nearby, perfect for a makeshift weapon. Gripping it tightly, I attempted to fend off their sharp claws and ferocious fangs. Marion struggled to free herself as the creatures seemed intent on hunting us down. Though we did our best to fight back with every last ounce of strength we possessed, it became increasingly clear that we were in way over our heads. Finally breaking free from her restraints, Marion managed to recover my backpack with our few remaining supplies, including a flare gun she thought to pack for emergencies. She fired a single shot into the sky as it illuminated the woods around us in a harsh red glow. The flare momentarily disoriented the creatures long enough for her frantic whispers to reach my ears. We need to reach higher ground. There's a ranger station not far from here. Marion and I began to run, searching desperately for higher ground, hoping to find the ranger station she mentioned. As we sprinted through the dark woods, the sinister creatures followed closely at our heels, their forms distorted and monstrous in the red glow of the flare. With every step terror pulsed through me, but there was no time to dwell on it. Survival was our only goal. We eventually stumbled upon a hill that led up to a small, run-down cabin. Under normal circumstances, I would never dream of seeking refuge in such a remote and seemingly abandoned place. But as I glanced back at the ghastly creatures closing in, I knew our options were limited. Marion spotted a weak point in one of the cabin's walls and, without hesitation, kicked it in so we could crawl inside. Inside the darkness of the cabin was a display of relics that seemed to have been untouched for years. Groping around for some kind of clue or weapon that could help us fend off the creatures outside, my hand found an old book with worn leather binding and dusty pages. It seemed completely out of place among the other items scattered around. Hearing heavy thuds against the cabin wall from outside, I knew we didn't have much time. Desperate for answers or help of any kind, I hastily flipped through the book's pages, hoping to find something, anything, that might give us a clue about what we were up against. Although I couldn't read most of the strange symbols scribbled down on those ancient pages, some words seemed familiar enough for me to understand parts of what they described. It appeared to be a catalog of sorts, filled with descriptions ranging from terrifying creatures to obscure bits of mythology. As I continued frantically skimming through it while Marion tried to barricade our only entrance with whatever she could find inside the cabin, my eyes suddenly fell upon an entry with illustrations that sent chills down my spine. They exactly resembled the creatures we were currently hiding from. According to the entry, these particular creatures were called Suzyga beings from Slavic folklore with a penchant for violence. While most would dismiss such things as mere myths, the horrifying reality outside our shrinking refuge could not be denied. The book detailed a few methods to repel the creatures, one of which I realized I had unintentionally used earlier with the flare gun. Light appeared to be our only savior against these dreadful monsters. Finally understanding what we were up against, I hurriedly searched through the old relics contained within the cabin and found an old lantern with a small amount of oil left in it. After miraculously igniting it, I slowly cracked open the door, praying our newly discovered knowledge would hold true. As I held out the lantern into the darkness, an angry hiss echoed through the air, confirming that our hypothesis was indeed correct. With newfound hope and determination, Marion and I exited the cabin. Armed with our meager weapons and lantern, we slowly made our way down from our hilltop refuge. The Suzygas seemed wary of approaching too closely now that they had witnessed the power of light firsthand. Without daring to look back in fear of what we would find lurking behind us, Marion and I stumbled upon a path that led us through the woods towards civilization. Exhausted both mentally and physically, 
We eventually reached a dirt road lined by several cabins with a functioning phone signal. I immediately contacted emergency services even though a part of me doubted whether they would truly comprehend or believe what we had just survived. Nevertheless, armed men soon arrived to ensure our safety. But as they surveyed the cabin that once protected us from evil incarnate, all traces of its supernatural inhabitants had vanished under scrutinizing eyes. Marion and I couldn't help but share a sleepless night together once everything was over, haunted by the knowledge of what lurked beyond the safety of our fortified dwelling. The following day, we relinquished that ancient and potentially cursed book to authorities in hopes it would never fall into another unsuspecting victim's hands. As life resumed in a seemingly unchanged manner, the fear and paranoia clung close like permanent shadows, serving as a stark reminder that although the Strazigas retreated into their dark dwellings once again, they were merely lurking in our world waiting for their next opportunity to strike terror in the hearts of those who stumbled across their path. I still remember when everything changed for me. It was supposed to be a fun and exciting trip with my friends. A weekend adventure to escape the monotony of daily life. Little did I know, the events that unfolded would leave me questioning everything I thought I knew about reality. My name is Thomas Warren, and this is my story. It all started when my friends and I decided to visit Shenandoah National Park, located in Virginia. Spanning over 200,000 acres of protected land, it's a well-known destination for hikers and nature enthusiasts alike. Tall trees loomed above us as we journeyed through the vast landscape on our way to an old, rented cabin in the middle of the park. On our second day there, we stumbled upon something haunting. A mutilated deer was discovered just off the trail where we were hiking. Its injuries were unlike anything I had ever seen before, far from a normal animal attack more methodical, precise even. My friend Jeremy Elwood suggested that perhaps a bear or some other predator had committed this brutal crime. Despite being disturbed by this new development, we decided to enjoy our adventure. We spent our days hiking various trails and cooking up meals around the campfire, while sharing stories of mild successes and embarrassing failures in our lives' typical chatter among friends. Then one evening as the sun dipped behind the surrounding mountains and darkness settled over camp, everything changed. Laura Vandervoort, another member of our close-knit group, suddenly let out a scream from within her tent. We rushed over to see what was wrong but were left speechless as we stared at what she held out toward us, a human finger. It appeared as though it had been partially chewed on, coated in dirt and blood. Panic set in, but with limited resources deep within the park for communication, we had no choice but to hunker down for the night and wait for morning to come. Desperately trying to lighten the mood and get our minds off the horrific discovery, Johnny Mitchell cracked an unfunny joke, but it did little to ease our unease. Sleep was nearly impossible that night as we could not shake the feeling of being watched every rustle and distant howl of an animal setting us on edge. The following morning, we decided that we needed to report the macabre findings to park rangers immediately. As we made our way toward the ranger station, we began to notice more signs of carnage, more animal corpses, all mutilated beyond comprehension. Our pace quickened, fear and urgency driving us forward in a frantic and all-consuming need for safety. As evening fell, we had finally arrived at the ranger's station. The rangers were attentive and concerned over our findings justifying our decision to approach them. While they couldn't identify any creature capable of such annihilation within their realm of expertise— they alerted local authorities and arranged an escort out of the park as soon as possible. 
We thought it was over that soon we'd be able to go home and put this dreadful experience behind us. But we couldn't have been more wrong. About two hours into our grim trail back towards civilization, my friends and I happened upon another gruesome sight, a partially devoured body. As the other stood still in horror, I ventured closer to examine the body further. The face was practically unrecognizable due to the severity of its injuries, but something seemed oddly familiar about this person, a feeling that sent shivers down my spine. Muffled cries then caught my attention from nearby bushes. Brushing aside some tangled branches revealed a monstrous creature its gnarled skin and disjointed limbs sending a jolt through me as I realized its gaze was firmly planted on me. Backing away cautiously while signaling my friends with dread-filled eyes not to provoke the terrible beast hulking in front of us, we inched away hoping to give it a wide berth. It appeared to be watching our every move, studying us like prey. Tension mounted as we bitterly realized this disturbing entity was the perpetrator, the monster responsible for the maiming and destruction. With the monstrous creature looming ahead, my friends and I evaluated our options. We need to do something, whispered Rachel, her voice quivering. We knew that merely running wouldn't be sufficient. It had followed and tormented us relentlessly. In the distance, we could see the faint outline of a remote cabin close to the path connecting the park exit. Hoping to buy enough time to reach safety and make a phone call for help, we decided on a plan to temporarily distract the creature. Mike reluctantly volunteered for the high-risk task, luring the creature slightly off course while the rest of us dashed towards safety. The plan was risky but seemed like our only hope of escape. With bated breath, Mike mustered his courage and threw a large rock towards a dense thicket of bushes away from our current position. The sound caught the creature's attention, and with surprising agility for something so monstrous, it lunged in pursuit of the foreign noise. Seizing the opportunity, we sprinted towards the cabin in desperate hope that Mike would catch up soon. Upon bursting through the door, I frantically searched for a phone to call for help while everyone else scanned the area for potential threats. The phone rang unanswered for what felt like an eternity before finally connecting with a park ranger. I hastily relayed our harrowing situation but struggled to describe our attacker accurately. It seemed unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Before I could finish explaining, we heard Mike's blood-curdling scream tearing through the silence. Panicked, I glanced out of a small window to see him falling to his knees as he futilely attempted to fend off the beast's vicious assault. His brave efforts allowed us valuable moments to reach safety, but at a horrifying cost. Outside, things fell silent once again. When help finally arrived moments later, I watched from behind Rachel's comforting embrace as they carried Mike's lifeless body away. Another victim of the unimaginable horror we'd stumbled upon. The head ranger, an older man named Thomas, managed to capture the monster from a distance with long-range weapons. We had never heard of such creatures existing before least of all in this park, but the evidence was indisputable. It was real, and it had taken two lives. What is that thing? Rachel whispered, grief-stricken and fearful. I'm not sure, confessed Thomas. It's a creature I've never seen before, though some believe it could be what's known as the Rougarou. A beast from folklore said to stalk and terrorize those who wander into its territory— he explained solemnly. As we collectively stared at the carcass of our pursuer, several questions raced through my mind. Why had it invaded the park? Were more of these creatures lurking nearby? But deep down, I realized these answers wouldn't erase the pain or bring back my friends any sooner. The rangers escorted us out of the park for our safety and transported us back to civilization. The following days were emotionally heavy, 
dealing with Mike's death and recounting our experiences to both authorities and family members left an indescribable sense of dread. There was no returning to normal after such traumatic events, but I found solace in sharing our story. My hope is that one day appropriate measures are taken to protect unsuspecting visitors from the lurking horrors of this world, mythical beasts or otherwise. In the meanwhile, on quiet nights as I sit alone in my room, memories of that fateful trip haunt me. Two friends have vanished from our close-knit group, their pain etched forever in my memory. I can only strive to remember them as they were in life, a beacon of joy during our adventure-filled days. Their sacrifices saved many others from succumbing to a similar gruesome fate. As time passes, I make a promise to never forget the brave acts of my friends and to ensure the world knows their story, a tale shrouded in mystery, fear, and sorrow. I woke up that morning with a pounding headache and a bad feeling about the day ahead of me. My name is Clyde Jensen, a seasoned hunter who moved to this tiny town near the dense forest in Clear Lake, Oregon to be near the woods. These days I hunt more out of habit than need. After I had my breakfast, I put on my favorite hunting gear, picked up my rifle, and grabbed some extra supplies. My best friend Jimmy, whom I had met in town, decided to join me today. We walked into the forest, remarking on some light banter about our lives. As we kept making our way through the woods, we noticed an unsettling silence. No birds chirping or squirrels rustling, just absolute silence. This should have waved a giant red flag for both of us. Instead, we attributed it to just being an unusual day and laughed it off. Nevertheless, we continued our hunt deeper into the forest when suddenly we stumbled upon something horrendous, the mutilated corpse of a young woman named Alice, who worked at the local diner. Her body and face were horribly gouged as though clawed by something massive. Nothing identifiable remained. We grimly decided that we should return to town immediately and report her death to Sheriff DeWalt. However, either one of us felt safe calling for help on our cell phones. Dead spots are fairly common in these woods. It was starting to get dark as Jimmy and I made our way back toward town when we noticed a figure lurking behind some trees along our path. We couldn't make out any details in the darkness aside from its enormous size towering over us by at least two feet. Looking at each other with sheer terror formed in our eyes knowing full well that running wouldn't be practical given the distance from town and sheer massiveness of whatever was observing us we prepared ourselves for a deadly encounter. Steadying our rifles, we aimed at the cloudy outline of the creature stalking us. Just as we were about to pull the triggers, it made piercing inhuman guttural sounds and charged violently towards us. Jimmy managed to fire one round directly into its abdomen as it charged. The creature let out an agonizing roar that resonated through our very bones as it staggered back a few steps momentarily slowing its approach. This small moment of hesitation by the creature allowed us to slowly back away maintaining our aim at its grisly torso. Every time the beast tried to staunchly pursue us, We'd fire spreading shots across its path to keep it at bay, all while gripping our rifles with hands shaking uncontrollably. Another hunter, Lawrence Palmer, who had been in the woods further south, approached after hearing our gunshots and came to our aid. He rapid-fired his shotgun at the monster's legs but was out of shells in no time. Now, fearing for our lives while processing all the grotesque events that had taken place all in one day, the creature hit Lawrence hard swiftly from behind, blood spraying across our faces. I yelled to Jimmy, Get back! Get Lawrence out of here! Jimmy grabbed Lawrence by his arm, trying to drag him away from the creature. 
I kept my rifle aimed at the beast as it towered over the fallen hunter. As if noticing me for the first time, it turned its grotesque head and locked its bloodshot eyes onto mine. Help me! I screamed at the top of my lungs, hoping someone else was close enough to hear. The creature snarled and took a heavy step towards me. I fired another shot, this time aimed directly at its head. The impact sent the creature stumbling backward, buying me precious time. I scrambled backwards but refused to take my eyes off the horrifying scene unfolding before me. As I continued to back away, I tripped and fell flat on my back, the wind knocked out of me. At that moment, the creature launched itself at me with terrifying speed. I aimed my rifle once more and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. I was out of ammo. The beast stopped in its tracks, sensing my helplessness. It bared its gnarled teeth and let out a low growl as it prepared for another lunge. Just then, we heard police sirens wailing in the distance, closing in on our location fast. The creature hesitated for a moment before giving an ear-piercing screech and disappearing into the dark woods. The police arrived minutes later, alerted by nearby residents who had heard our gunshots. There wasn't much time to explain what had happened as they focused their attention on Lawrence and rushed him to a nearby hospital. In the days following that bone-chilling encounter, our small town was abuzz with rumors about what had occurred in the woods. No one could come up with a reasonable explanation for what we saw that night, other than that it was some sort of undiscovered species or a severely mutated bear or wolf. Jimmy and I decided to keep our distance from the woods for the time being, ritualistically checking our ammunition before going out on any hunting trips in the future. Lawrence, unfortunately, didn't make it. His injuries were too severe, and he passed away at the hospital. As we mourned our friend and fellow hunter, we couldn't help but feel unease about the horrors that could be hiding in the shadows. However, no further sightings were reported, and life, albeit with an underlying tension, slowly returned to normal. But one thing is certain— no one will ever forget that haunting night when Tara came stalking out of the darkness. My name is Carter Johnson, and I'm standing in the dense Appalachian forest, feeling the nerve-wracking stillness as I wait for my fellow hunters. We're part of a specialized task force notorious for tracking and hunting monsters that pose a threat to humanity. As we set out on our secret mission, I recall my personal experience growing up on a simple farm in rural Georgia. It's important for me to remain down to earth and focused on our objective. The task force is filled with people like me, people who've faced monstrous tragedies and managed to come out stronger. The team consists of Marvin Walker, our marksman, Lee Morgan, an expert tracker, and Sasha Ivanov, our communication officer. We work like clockwork, with each person taking the responsibility they were assigned. Our faith in one another is what makes us strong, even when faced with unspeakable horrors. Before long, we reach a gruesome scene— Several missing persons from the nearby town had been eviscerated in a brutal attack. I fight back the bile rising in my throat. Nothing could prepare us for something so disturbing. After analyzing the evidence left behind at the scene, Lee deduces the direction in which the monster had escaped, leading us deeper into the woods. The terrain becomes treacherous as thick vegetation consumes our path, and tensions rise among us as we tighten our grip on guns. Suddenly, we hear rustling leaves and shallow breaths cut through the deafening silence of the night. From behind an ancient oak tree emerges an enormous creature that I had never laid eyes upon before. Its flesh peels from its muscular frame as it lumbers towards us with unnatural speed. 
Its massive claws leave deep grooves in the forest floor while oversized fangs protrude from a grotesque maw that stretches wider than seems possible. As adrenaline courses through me, I grasp firm onto my weapon only to realize it's useless against such an otherworldly opponent. Marvin fires several shots into the beast's chest, the sound echoing like thunder through the treetops. But it barely falters as my heart sinks from a fleeting ray of hope. Protect the others! I yell, charging at the creature in an act of desperation. Using my training to execute a series of strategic maneuvers, I draw its attention, giving my teammates enough time to call for backup. I'm acutely aware that their help won't arrive soon enough. It's up to me in this twisted dance with death. As the nightmarish monster lunges for my exposed throat, I barely dodge out of its reach in time. I curse under my breath, not because the task force shouldn't have been warned about this monster's existence, but because it didn't seem like anything that could exist on this earth at all. As though picking up on my thoughts, Sasha exclaims over our communication device with shaky breath. Guys! Reports say it could be a skinwalker, a creature that can transform into any animal shape. The menacing creature continues its relentless assault, and we fight back with everything we've got. Panic and disbelief fuel our adrenaline, forcing us to dig deeper for survival than ever before. Amidst the life-or-death chaos, creeping doubt snags at the back of our minds. Is this truly a skinwalker? Could they even exist as more than folklore? Logic and reason battle against what stands before us as we try to make sense of what seems to defy explanation. But there's no time for lingering uncertainty. The onslaught doesn't relent. It only increases in intensity as hairs stand on end and primal fear courses through every beat of our hearts. We edge closer to desperate despair. Every shot fired seems futile as they only serve to push us past our limits. Even if we survive this night, how can we ever feel safe again? In those dark moments, our communication device crackles to life, finality sinking heavy in Sasha's choked-out words. Backup is still too far out. It's up to us. Realizing that backup would not arrive in time, our team had to work together to confront this monstrous creature. We could no longer afford to dwell on whether or not it was a skinwalker. Our sole focus was on survival. I glanced over at Sasha while evading another vicious lunge and tried to convey the urgency in my eyes. We need to find a way to slow it down, at least, Sasha said, searching for any possible weakness in the monster. Let's try something unconventional. I yelled across the fray as we continued our feeble attempts at repelling the creature from attacking us. If it can change its shape, perhaps we can trick it into transforming into something less dangerous. We decided to call for help one last time before enacting our desperate plan. We didn't know why our calls were going unanswered, but this idea seemed like the only viable option to survive. Much like a pack of animals drawing in a predator, we all moved closer together. As the creature lunged at us again, we swiftly moved aside and scattered, forcing the monstrosity into a dead-end trap of its own creation. Feigning injury, I shouted, Guys, it bit me! I think, I think I'm turning into, into something! The others joined, forcefully pantomiming excruciating pain while groaning and collapsing wordlessly on the ground. As hoped, this apparent weakness piqued the creature's interest. It hesitated before adopting a more defensive stance. It studied us with its glowing eyes that seemed disturbingly human while we writhed and twisted on the ground, pretending to suffer some unknown transformation. The ploy worked. The creature grew agitated and confused by our transformation display. It suddenly let out an ear-splitting screech and shifted form in front of our eyes. Instead of the gargantuan terror that was attacking us moments ago, a human-like figure stood, 
bewildered. Seizing the opportunity, we quickly overcame our shock and sprinted towards one of the task force's armed vehicles parked nearby. We could hear the sounds of the confused human-like creature behind us, but he didn't follow, perhaps still disoriented from our trick. With shaky hands, I locked the doors and started the engine. My team members, tired and weary from the chaos, exhale in relief as we sped away from what could have been our demise. The creature had turned into something far less threatening thanks to our last-ditch effort. Once at a safe distance, we reported back to headquarters about the terrifying encounter and our narrow escape. What they told us brought us to a halt. Other specialized teams, like ours, had encountered similar monsters that defied explanation. It seemed that this was only the beginning. Days passed, and we mourned those who had fallen to the creature's relentless assault. We struggled to comprehend what we had seen and whether it was an isolated incident or indicative of something more sinister. Measures were taken to ensure that backup wouldn't be delayed again like that fateful day. As news spread about these mysterious creatures, whispers grew about a new threat looming over humanity. But despite our fear, one thing became certain, faced with an unknown enemy— it was up to us to adapt and survive. In the end, it took just days for these terrifying incidents became all but forgotten, despite shreds of evidence collected by specialized teams like ours. What these creatures were portrayed might be forever out of reach for ordinary people to comprehend or even know existed. However, in those darkest moments when primal fear takes hold as though rooted deep within humanity's shared memory, with each hair standing on end like an antenna. We would remember everything about that night, the glowing eyes filled with malice lurking only inches from annihilation, how fragile life seemed as we came face to face with the stuff of nightmares. And we would truly appreciate that even though we couldn't eradicate evil completely, we could learn to adapt and survive. For those who knew the true face of terror, the horrors would never be forgotten. This happened to me six years ago when I stumbled upon an off-the-grid place called Winding Pine Hollow in the wilds of Oregon. My name is Broderick Hollis, and it was during a solo hiking trip that my life changed forever. The dense forest swallowed me within its depths. The sound of leaves crunching underneath my boots echoed throughout. A broken signpost greeted me as I entered the abandoned campsite. Winding Pine Hollow abandoned and forgotten as evidenced by the overgrown vegetation and decrepit structures. I befriended Carmine Eldridge, an experienced outdoorsman who'd made camp nearby. He shared his knowledge generously, teaching me how to fend for myself in these untamed surroundings. Carmine jokingly said, You know what's scarier than bears or wolves out here, my friend? The quiet... Silence in the woods can be deafening. Days went by peacefully until we heard screams break that very silence we had joked about. We rushed towards a toppled camper, dreading what we might find inside. There, we discovered a terrified family Marcellus Wainwright, his wife Theodosia and their son Raleigh. They trembled at the thought of what had attacked them moments earlier. With arms like branches and eyes glowing like embers, it tore through our camper with ease. Marcellus choked out between sobs. Carmine scoffed initially, but seeing their terror, he gathered our makeshift group and loaded our rifles, not knowing what we sought but spurred by duty nonetheless. We waded deeper into winding Pine Hollow's sinister heart, with each passing step finding gut-wrenching signs of viciousness and death through missing hikers and mutilated wildlife alike. Our first true confrontation occurred when we came face to face with the creature while traversing a choking thicket of trees. Bathed in moonlight, it reared up on hind limbs, 
towering over us like some grotesque mockery of man and beast merged together. It did not speak as it lunged towards us with terrifying speed, frenzied and enraged. Carmine fired first, the shot echoing in the night. The creature reeled at the impact but only for a moment. An unnatural howl of rage pierced the cool night air, rattling us to our bones as we scrambled to defend ourselves against the relentless onslaught. Our nights devolved into a desperate struggle for survival. We cursed our decision to remain yet felt compelled to exact justice upon this living nightmare that haunted our every waking moment. Our band dwindled slowly, lives snuffed out one by one as the creature hunted us across winding Pine Hollow's unforgiving landscape. Before his own tragic end, I remember Marcellus admitting through cracked lips that he hadn't worn his wedding ring since losing it a month back. He joked how this madness seemed like divine punishment for such an oversight. I racked my own brain for what sin could have unleashed this terror upon me. The thing that once was Raleigh sought me out one horrendous night, clutching broken and twisted hands against its chest where Carmine's bullet had struck so many days ago. We tried to fend off the creature, doing whatever we could to keep it at bay. My hands trembled as I grabbed a heavy, jagged branch, hoping it would be enough to temporarily deter our tormentor. The other members of our group followed suit, grabbing whatever makeshift weapons they could grasp. Instead of summoning help, we were isolated and alone. The dense forest surrounded us on all sides, stifling any possibility of escape or assistance. Out here, nobody knew of our presence, and the creature seemed keenly aware of that fact. The monster flailed wildly, its twisted limbs snapping towards us like the jaws of a vicious predator. Its snarls grew louder, more guttural and hate-filled as it fought to claim each person it attacked. In a sudden moment of opportunity, Carmine lunged at Raleigh with yet another gunshot aimed at the mutated beast. He hid his mark, and amid the cacophony of screams and chaos emerged in eerie silence— as Raleigh staggered back before collapsing onto the ground. Carmine approached what he believed to be Raleigh's lifeless form, but soon learned it was not yet finished. With incredible speed and ferocity, the creature sprang up and knocked him aside before retreating into the undergrowth. I scrambled to help my injured friends off the ground while keeping an eye out for any sign of its return. Marcellus was gone now alongside several others claimed by its insatiable thirst for violence. Those fortunate to have escaped death suffered from gruesome injuries that necessitated immediate attention. The realization that we should summon aid in treating our wounds came too late for those who were already gone. I scoured my pockets from my phone but found something peculiar that I didn't recognize, an intricate feather carved from wood. Puzzled by its appearance in my possession, I clenched it in my hand tightly during the time it took for us to be rescued from our predicament. We sought answers, researching the creature, but finding none. Everything seemed like a hopeless endeavor until I came across something that matched what we encountered. I stumbled upon storied accounts of skinwalkers— shape-shifting beings said to have malicious intentions towards anyone unfortunate enough to cross their path. Although the concept seemed detached from reality, it felt like the closest explanation to the nightmare we endured. A deep regret and guilt washed over me as I thought about Marcella's wife and children, now left without a husband and father. There was no explanation or plausible reason for why this monstrosity existed or targeted us. We were simply victims of an unfathomable cruelty that forged our ruined lives. Feeling a strange connection to the wooden feather found in my pocket I kept it close, as if it embodied some otherworldly wisdom. The amulet-like token served as a chilling reminder of the horrors we faced in Winding Pine Hollow. In the aftermath of our desperate struggle for survival, grief and loss permeated each day since that fateful encounter. 
The eerie silence filling my home felt oppressive as I considered how lives had irreparably changed at the hands of this unexplainable entity. With no explanation for the creature's existence and Raleigh's transformation in sight, we vowed never to speak of our ordeal again. It was simply too much to bear, an unseen scar we carried with us forever. My fellow survivors and I remained shaken by those dark days, forever bound by a terrifying secret we dared not share with the world. This happened to me a long time ago in Kenilworth, Utah. After a hectic day, I decided to take a shortcut through the mountains. My name's Samuel Forrester, and back then, I was working two jobs just to make ends meet. Midway, my car began to sputter and gave out. It was getting dark and I didn't have any cell reception, so I started walking. I kept thinking of my wife and three kids at home, praying for their safety. As I walked, I came across typical mountain scenery, trees, rocks, but something stuck out. It was a large bone, maybe human or animal. Puzzled but curious, I pocketed it as evidence. Hours later, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Curiosity got the better of me and I peeked in. The sight inside turned my stomach. Blood-stained walls and a makeshift table with rusty knives lay inside. Panic set in. However, remembering my family waiting for me at home gave me strength. I knew I had to find help or at least a place with cell signal. As night fell and temperatures dropped, my concern deepened. Walking by moonlight along the deserted mountain path, I followed the sound of water in hopes of reaching civilization. I eventually heard faint laughter echoing through the trees and felt relieved thinking they could help me out. Warily approaching them, it was difficult to see faces in the pitch-black darkness but there were at least five people gathered around a roaring fire. Relief turned into horror as they pulled out weapons, an axe and some hunting knives. They were disfigured mountain men with twisted smiles who barked, Fresh meat! Suddenly realizing the predicament I was in, the bone from earlier being a warning sign, my heart raced and my survival instincts kicked in. I sprinted back through the woods with adrenaline surging through me as they chased after me, whooping like it was a game. Slicing through the trees to create obstacles, I tried putting distance between us until I came across an old forest shed, just barely keeping out of their grasp. I locked myself in and clumsily fashioned a makeshift weapon, a sharpened stick, hoping I would never have to use it. They hammered on the door, relentlessly taunting me. As they continued their assault on the door, my agile brain considered my options. Climbing up into the rafters of the shed, I positioned myself above the door in anticipation of buying some time once they broke in. The door finally gave way and the mountain men rushed in. The first two entered, and I kicked them down, taking advantage of their temporary confusion. Using my makeshift weapon, I stabbed it into one's leg to slow him down. The unexpected attack clearly annoyed them, their wrath intensified. The remaining ones charged at me with unsettling enthusiasm as I desperately tried to dodge and escape at every turn. Knowing there was no backup and my will to live being all that stood between me and a grisly fate, the intensity of the situation reached terrifying levels. The chasing mountain men seemed relentless and unstoppable as I narrowly persevered time after time. My exhaustion weighed heavy when reaching deeper into those dark woods, as shadows and noises melded into an endless nightmare of survival. Sounds of their growling laughter continued haunting me from an unseen distance. With each step, my world swayed between hopelessness and determination. My legs knew no rest as branches clawed at me, leaving bloodied scratches behind. 
The moon offered little solace as the grim chase carried on with such ferocity that it seemed impossible it would ever end. Desperately searching for a way out, or some place to hide in the darkness, I stumbled upon a large rock and fell, tumbling off the trail. My body collided with the ground below, causing a searing pain to shoot through my ribs. Amidst the agony, I realized that I had unintentionally stumbled upon a small cave. With no time to lose, I quickly crawled into the cave, clutching my side and wincing against the pain. Inside was dark, damp, and musty, but at least it provided temporary cover from the relentless chase of the murderous mountain men. From my hidden spot in the cave, I watched as they searched for me with torches in their hands and gnashing teeth as they snarled in frustration. As minutes passed by, their pace slowed. It was clear that the mountain men were losing their patience and becoming desperate themselves. The opportunity to make use of this moment dawned on me this was the perfect time to make my escape. With slow breaths to steady myself against my continued pain, I waited until there was a considerable distance to ensure that they wouldn't notice me exiting the cave. Summoning every bit of strength within me, I forced myself out of my hiding and back onto my feet while bracing against the pain that threatened to consume me. Limping heavily, I began moving in the opposite direction of where the mountain men had headed. As I made my way through dark woods putting as much distance between me and them as possible, it became more apparent that finding help was now more crucial than ever. My phone's battery had drained during this chaotic ordeal leaving me with no means of contact or navigation. Suddenly, I came across a narrow dirt road that led towards what seemed like civilization a small wooden cabin. Hoping for some form of assistance or refuge within those walls, I approached its door and knocked with what little energy I had left. To my surprise, a frail elderly woman opened the door. She immediately saw the panic in my eyes and recognized the desperate situation I was in. She quickly ushered me inside, locking the door behind us. Out of breath from running from cannibals, I managed to tell her about the mountain men who were aggressively pursing me. Her face contorted into that of horror, and without hesitation, she picked up her phone and dialed the police. She informed the operator of my situation and requested assistance. The waiting for help felt like an eternity, but eventually, we heard the sirens approaching. The police stormed into her cabin armed and prepared to face any danger that may come our way. The elderly woman and I were led out by law enforcement to their vehicles safely. As we were leaving, I began to think about the others who hadn't been as fortunate as me in escaping their grisly fate amidst those mountains. It has since been weeks after the terrifying night in those woods, but its haunting impact lingers on. Word of the cannibalistic mountain men spread fast and wide. Investigations are ongoing with several mountain men now in custody. While proper mourning can never truly take place for those who have lost their lives at their hands or even pay respects to those whose bodies never were found, it is comforting knowing that these heinous individuals are being ripped from society one by one ending this dark chapter for all potential innocent victims. This happened to me six years ago, right before my lunch break at Pines National Forest. The sun shone brightly on my orange vest, while I was busy keeping the trail clean and free of debris. My name's Arnaldo de Vries, by the way, a simple forest worker who loves the outdoors. Working out here had always been a pleasant experience. I felt content with the solitude and serenity of the woods until that fateful day when everything changed. As I pressed forward along the trail, I came across something that made my stomach churn, a grotesque display of violence. Unidentifiable body parts littered the ground. 
What could have done this? My first instinct was to call for help. But remembering that my cell phone had no signal within these dense woods, I decided to make my way back to my truck located near the entrance of the forest. Panic crept through me as I maneuvered between the tall trees. In my haste, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite and a group consisting of Victoria Carling, Warren Desjardins, and Johanna Kozlovsky. Despite being strangers to me, they seemed trustworthy. We exchanged our stories and decided it would be best to stick together. As we navigated through the forest, we heard muffled noises coming from a distance. It sounded like someone in pain. We discovered Eddie Talbot staggering along the path with injuries covering his body. He looked scared as though he'd been running from something or someone. He said he had tried shooting at it with his gun but couldn't get a clear shot because of its swift movements. It didn't look like any animal I've ever seen, he gasped. Jokingly attempting to lift our spirits, I said, Maybe it was Bigfoot in disguise. This brought faint smiles to their faces for a moment before reality struck again. We decided to keep moving, with fear making our hearts race faster. We found a small cave nearby where we could gather our thoughts and develop a plan. Inside the cave, we examined ourselves and our surroundings, looking for anything that could be of help. Warren found a long metal rod, which he handed over to Victoria. Johanna and Eddie remained unarmed but vigilant. As darkness enveloped the forest, our sense of dread increased. We couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched or perhaps hunted by whatever this creature was. It wasn't long before that feeling intensified into full-blown terror when we heard guttural growls echoing through the trees. Each sound drew closer and closer until finally, we got our first glimpse at what had been stalking us a twisted figure lurking in the shadows. This creature was unlike anything I had ever seen its words cannot properly convey its appearance. A monstrous fusion of man and beast, its body covered in coarse fur with unnaturally large limbs ending in razor-sharp claws. In a hushed voice, Johanna asked, What do we do now? Victoria tightly gripped the metal rod in her hand, responding, We have no choice but to defend ourselves. Our adrenaline soared as we braced for the inevitable confrontation. As it crept nearer, each movement slow and deliberate, its monstrous features became clearer. Its eyes glinted, like two blood-red orbs, contrasted sharply by its grotesque snarl that seemed to mock our very existence. Warren yelled desperately, "'Somebody help us! Please!' Despite knowing no one could hear us within this isolated forest, their desperation resonated through the dense woods like an eerie echo. The creature continued to lurk, its blood-red eyes focused on us as it stalked closer. Eddie whispered, We need to move. If we stay here, it'll kill us all. We didn't have much of a choice. So we agreed and began making our way through the dark forest while the grotesque creature followed. As we ventured deeper into the woods, trying our best to avoid making any noise, we couldn't help but be painfully aware of every snapping twig or rustling leaf. The creature's guttural growls resonated behind us, never too far away. We knew that it could easily catch up to us if it wanted to but it seemed to enjoy stalking its prey prolonging our torment. We have to find some help, Warren whispered desperately. We realized that calling for help was nearly impossible at this point. Our surroundings didn't provide any opportunity for rescue. We were isolated in the forest with no visible signs of civilization nearby. The gruesome beast kept its distance but never let us out of its sight. At one point, we found ourselves trapped in a clearing surrounded by dense foliage on all sides. With nowhere left to run, we braced ourselves for the inevitable confrontation. 
Victoria wielded the metal rod defensively as the creature slowly revealed itself from the shadows. Its hulking form towered over us while its horrifying face was illuminated by the faint moonlight above. With an animalistic snarl, the creature lunged for Eddie first. Despite his best efforts to dodge, its razor-sharp claws connected with his arm, slicing through flesh and muscle like butter. Eddie! Johanna screamed in terror as he crumpled to the forest floor in agonizing pain. Before anyone could react further, the creature targeted Warren next dragging him away before sinking its teeth into his leg. As Warren writhed and screamed in pain, we knew that we were all next if we didn't act quickly. Fueled by adrenaline, Victoria swung the metal rod with all her might connecting with the creature's head. To our surprise, the impact sent the monster reeling back, buying us precious time to escape. Without hesitation, Johanna and I hoisted Eddie between our shoulders and hobbled away with Warren limping not far behind. With the guttural growls fading into the distance, we knew that the creature was biding its time, waiting for another opportunity to strike. In an attempt to find help, we stumbled across an old cabin after hours of limping through the darkness. We cautiously entered the structure in hopes of finding a refuge from the nightmare unfolding outside. The cabin was modest and showed signs of being abandoned for a long time. Inside, we did our best to find makeshift bandages for Eddie and Warren's injuries. Their eyes expressed their silent gratitude as we cared for them while constantly watching the cabin's entrance awaiting the creature's imminent return. As dawn approached, the agonizing screams of Eddie and Warren subsided as their faces turned pale and life began to slip from their bodies. We tried our best to fight back tears as we watched our friends slip away knowing there was nothing more we could do for them. Soon after sunrise, we ventured outside to bury their bodies in a shallow grave behind the cabin. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than leaving them for that horrendous creature to ravage further. Victoria and I silently continued our quest for help or any sign of civilization. Our bodies ached from exhaustion and despair enveloped us in an overwhelming manner. But somewhere inside us, anger festered anger towards this unknown monster terrorizing innocent people like us. We never saw that creature again as we finally reached soothing meadows near a highway which ended our harrowing ordeal within the forest. Despite being traumatized by the loss of our friends, we vowed to share our story with others. We hoped that knowing about the existence of this terrifying beast could help prevent anyone from suffering a similar fate. From then on, the events of that horrifying night lived on as both a reminder and warning for those who ventured too deep within those forsaken woods. I woke up to the blaring sound of my phone, a disturbance that could indicate only one thing, an emergency. My name is Jedediah Copeland, but people around Hudson, Ohio, where I work as a small-town cop, just call me Jed. My initial reluctance for a long day ahead quickly evaporated when I thought about Martha and the kids waiting for me back home. Before losing myself in thoughts about dinner plans, I received a call from Deputy Samuelson with a stuttering voice reporting something impossible. A sudden surge of murders and missing persons in our quiet small town. Unsure of his sanity at this point, I tried to console him. Sammy, settle down. Let's grab our gear and see what this is all about. Despite my skepticism, a chill ran up my spine as we arrived at the crime scene. The sight defied description, dismembered bodies like some gruesome piece of modern art painted in blood. A nauseating mix of shock and horror washed over me. What could have done this? Samuelson questioned aloud. The crime scene suggested that whatever was responsible might not be human at all. As we collected evidence, 
the feeling of unease persisted. More reports flooded in as whispers amongst the townspeople grew louder regarding an unknown creature lurking around town. A brief moment of levity came when our boss cracked an ill-timed joke. You know it's bad when even telling dad jokes can't lighten the mood, sighed Samuelson. Little did we know that acknowledging that we don't have enough time to place barricades on streets would become morbidly ironic. I tried to rationalize the murders by attributing them to some rogue animal or a disturbed criminal. But deep down inside, I knew that theory wouldn't hold for long as my fellow officers spoke in hushed tones about the terrifying reality staring us in the face. Whatever was out there was capable of killing us all. As angry as I was about the murders and the loved ones that had been taken from their families, I couldn't quell the terror festering within me at the prospect of this unknown beast lurking just beyond sight. The seemingly coordinated attacks only fueled our questions. Were these murders connected to a nearby escaped convict? I decided to visit the local library to research any historical data on similar incidents or folklore that could somehow explain this creature's existence. That was when I stumbled upon a disturbing pattern. Reports from over a century ago described a monster of indescribable horror that would appear to deliver death and destruction every few generations. The description was frighteningly accurate, a gnarled creature standing on four legs, razor-sharp claws like gleaming sides, and eyes that pierced the soul. It hunted in vicious bursts, eluding capture before disappearing for years at a time. My hands shook as I read through witness accounts of primitive weaponry like bullets and blades only passing through the seemingly immortal creature. Was there no way to stop it? Word around town spread faster than wildfire as panic reached fever pitch. Our demands for reinforcements fell on deaf ears as other forces regarded us as victims of shared hysteria. People turned their fear into aggression, attacking us for our inability to protect them. Hudson had become a pressure cooker of terror with no release in sight. Resolving to end this ordeal, Samuelson procured extra ammunition and firearms from the armory. With grim determination etched on his face, he remarked, We can't bring back those we lost, but maybe we can put an end to this madness. The irony didn't go unnoticed. Two cops outgunned and outmatched by an enigmatic creature straight out of humanity's worst nightmares. An abrupt report of another attack came through our radios as we raced towards the scene. The lack of daylight coupled with dense foliage in the forest blurred our perception. Hearts pounding, we advanced cautiously, weapon in hand. As Samuelson and I approached the attack site, we noticed a commotion near the edge of the forest. The local townsfolk had gathered, forming an angry mob intent on bringing the creature down regardless of their lack of skill or weaponry. Their fear-fueled determination rang clear in their shouts and hurried arguments. We decided to split up, thinking it would be best if he talked to the agitated mob while I approached the scene of the attack. Although we could have called for backup, we knew that any hope for it was slim due to disbelief from higher-ups. We had to address the immediate threat ourselves. Cautiously, weapon at the ready, I edged toward where the last attack occurred. There were unmistakable signs of struggle, branches ripped from trees, deep claw marks gouged into bark, and splatters of blood painting a horrifying scene. However, there seemed to be no sign of life, not even an injured survivor. I pressed further through the forest, gun raised as my eyes scanned left and right for any sign of movement. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the thick silence of the forest, a cry that was abruptly cut short mere seconds later. Panic gripped me as I rushed toward its origin, hoping against all odds that I might save whoever was in danger. Instead, I stumbled upon a chilling sight, 
a mutilated body which seemed to have been almost crushed before being torn apart by whatever beast had inflicted such savagery upon it. The mere sight threatened to make me sick, but still I persisted cautiously forward. The creature was close. I could feel its presence bearing down on me like an oppressive weight. The air grew colder and heavy with malice as I continued searching for this monstrous embodiment of terror itself. Then, without warning, it was there. Its foul stench filled my nostrils as its shadow fell over me from above. It snarled menacingly, revealing its rows of jagged, discolored teeth and malevolent eyes that burned with fury. Recognizing the grave peril I found myself in, I raised my weapon toward the creature and emptied the chamber. Bullets flew but passed right through it as if it weren't even there. The eldritch monstrosity lunged at me, but narrowly missed. I sprinted back toward the town, desperately hoping Samuelson had convinced the townsfolk to disperse and return to safety. We need to evacuate. I gasped as I stumbled into his embrace. This creature is unstoppable. We're outmatched. Samuelson nodded, his face strained of color yet set in determination. I'll organize a mandatory evacuation, he replied briskly. We can't stop this thing on our own. Days later, we stood together as we watched Hudson disappear in the rearview mirror of our cruiser. Most residents had fled while a small number decided to continue living within their doomed town, knowing full well the horror that awaited them. After endless discussions with experts in various fields, we still had no answers about what species the creature belonged to or how to deal with it. All we knew was that for now, it remained among those who stayed behind in Hudson, a terrifying reminder of our vulnerability when faced with an inexplicable enemy. In time, memories began to fade and whispered stories were locked away in dusty corners of consciousness. We kept records of all we had witnessed so others might learn from our experiences if history ever repeated itself though we hoped against hope that it would not. Instead, we moved forward. We built new lives far away from the nightmare that haunted us like an unshakable specter. Even now, as I write these words down decades later, I find myself looking over my shoulder every so often, wondering whether one day those burning eyes will find me again. For the truth remains ever-present. There are horrors in this world beyond our comprehension, horrors which threaten to tear apart our very existence, and when they emerge from the shadows, we must be ready. I stretched after a long drive, looking up at the cabin I rented for some much-needed alone time. My name is Marlon Ebersole, and I'm a pharmacist back in a small town in Alabama. The solitude of Harrington Forest in Washington State sounded perfect after that divorce ordeal. As I unloaded my car, a scruffy man maybe in his late sixties ambled over. "'Looks like you're the new guy in these woods.' he remarked. The name Silas Redding. Nice to meet you, Silas, I replied. He squinted as he stared into the distance. You know, this area has some strange stories. A couple of folks have disappeared and haven't been found. Aren't there hikes and forests everywhere? People tend to get lost sometimes. I pointed out while I unloaded my suitcase. Silas shrugged. Just thought you should know. Thanks for the heads up. I responded with a friendly smile, waving goodbye as Silas wandered away. After settling into the cabin, I decided to take a leisurely walk to explore the surroundings. The dense trees, combined with occasional patches of sunlight filtering through the foliage, painted a beautiful picture of nature's handiwork. A sudden crackling sound startled me. As I turned around, I found a deer carcass lying on the ground mutilated beyond recognition. 
It looked like it had been mauled by a wild animal. Unease building up inside of me, but unwilling to let fear take over, I continued my walk cautiously. In another area of the forest, I discovered an abandoned shack covered in rust and moss. Spying an old newspaper clipping nailed to the wooden wall, I strained my eyes to read. Three campers vanished from Harrington Forest. Search called off. It was dated some years back. Before long, however, I spotted another set of footprints. They ended abruptly, as if someone had just vanished. Standing there, I couldn't shake off that unsettling feeling of being watched but brushed it off as my overactive imagination. That night, while sitting on the cabin porch, I heard rustling in the trees nearby. Peering into the dark shadows, I saw a tall humanoid figure standing eerily still. I felt its piercing gaze freeze me on the spot. The creature's head appeared wolf-like with sharp teeth that seemed to glow menacingly in the moonlight. My instincts screamed to get inside and bolt the door, so I hastily obeyed them. Fumbling with my phone, sweat beating down my brow as terror gripped my heart, I dialed Silas' number attempting to call for help. "'What's up?' he answered gruffly. "'Silas,' I stammered. "'There's something outside my cabin. "'ITIT doesn't look human. "'Calm down, Marlin. "'You're just scaring yourself.' "'Silas,' my voice shook as I tried to maintain composure. "'I'm not joking around here. "'Please come over. "'Bring something to defend ourselves with.' "'All right.' he sighed skeptically. I'll be there with my shotgun. Listening closely to any movements outside and racking my brain to identify that creature from folklore or horror movies, I try not to let panic consume me. The sound of knocking startled me back from my thoughts. Opening the door cautiously, Silas barged and a shotgun cradled in his arms. Where's this thing you're so afraid of? he demanded. I don't know, I admitted. It was near the trees over there. Suddenly, deafening growls shook the cabin walls as that monstrous creature lunged from its hiding spot among the darkness with gnarled claws that slashed through the splintering wood. Silas aimed his shotgun at the beast and fired as it lunged toward us with alarming speed. Silas' shotgun roared, but the creature seemed unfazed by the blast. Instead, it swiped at him with its claw, gashing his forearm. Silas cried out in pain, his shotgun falling to the floor. With a bellowing roar, the creature's eyes locked onto me. Its twisted visage was haunting. Instead of fur, oily black tendrils writhed around its body like a decaying fringe. The snout was short and blunt and a trail of shiny black jewel dripped from its maw filled with jagged teeth. Run, Marlin! Silas shouted through gritted teeth as he scrambled for his shotgun. Heeding his advice, I fled the cabin as fast as my legs could carry me. I could hear the creature stomping after me, and its guttural growls shook my very essence. As I burst into a clearing near my cabin, a family of deer darted out of my path. So this is what they were fleeing from earlier. Fueled by adrenaline, I continued sprinting, my heart in my throat. In my panic, I did not even grab my cell phone to call for help. After what felt like hours of running and listening to that monster's incessant growls behind me, I saw lights from a nearby road. Salvation. As I approached the road's edge, an unmarked police cruiser happened to drive past, caught by sheer luck. Frantically waving at it, I managed to attract the attention of the two officers inside. They stopped their car and got out, guns aimed at whatever danger they thought was charging after me. "'What's chasing you?' barked one officer authoritatively. "'I don't know.' I spat out between gasps for breath. "'Some monster!' It, it attacked Silas. Without hesitation, 
One officer radioed for backup while the other ushered me to the safety of their cruiser. As we waited for backup to arrive, the sound of vicious growls emerged. And in the dim glow of the road's single street light, a horrific scene unfolded. Silas had put on a brave face and followed me to the clearing, shotgun still clutched in his bloodied hands. But before he could make it to safety, the creature lunged furiously after him. The officers exchanged a terse glance before unloading several rounds into the beast. Loaded down with buckshot, it recoiled and fled back into the shadows. Backup arrived within minutes. Both animal control and police forces swarmed the area they dubbed the Green Hell. Although Silas was found severely injured, he was alive. When asked about what attacked us, I could only describe what I saw, a monster with writhing tendrils and hungry eyes. For a while, our story made headlines. Local news crews flocked to my cabin incessantly with their cameras and interviews. But as time dragged on, interest faded away like wallpapers left out in the sun. Silas eventually recovered from his injuries but left town shortly after his release from hospital. As for me, I moved far away as far away from forests and secluded cabins as humanly possible. The nightmare never faded from my memory entirely. Though I couldn't wage any war against that dark menace nor knew its motivations or weaknesses, I did manage to escape its terrible grasp. A grim urban legend sprouted from our misfortune, tales of malevolent spirits or monstrous animals lurking in the green hell. The fantastical theories involving mutants or cryptids spread like wildfire amongst curious thrill-seekers. And every once in a while as I sit in my city apartment, staring restlessly at old newspaper clippings framed on my wall, I distinctly recall the chilling growls from that nightmarish creature, an unholy amalgamation of man and beast, fueled by some ferocious, primal hunger. Its origin? Unknown. Its purpose? To hunt and terrify. Its presence? still lurking somewhere deep within the forests, far out of sight, but never entirely forgotten.